Today is February the 25th, 2018. My name is Tanya Pincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and today with me also is Ben Pollard, and we're here to speak with Mason Mungle, and this is going to be part of our Oklahoma's Conser Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, so thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. <laughs> I've got a long list of what, why, why you're here, but we'll let you tell it as we go along. So, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Durant, Oklahoma. Uh, our family lived in Atoka, and that was the closest, best hospital, uh, May 2nd, 1948. Okay. And what did your parents do for a living? Uh, they had a dairy farm. We milked Guernsey cows and uh, processed milk and delivered it to uh, uh, to a token surrounding communities we at the time that we shut it down in uh, in the delivery the delivery and processing in 1978 we uh, delivered in six counties yeah. pretty big operation yeah it was it was and brothers and sisters uh, uh, there was five children uh, Marshall Mason Melinda Matthew and Margaretta all M's. All M's. <laughs> well, not really. My name is Benjamin Mason. Okay. And <clears throat> and I asked mother if she changed my name on my birth certificate, and she said yes. I thought so, but no. And <laughs> my birth certificate is Benjamin Mason, Uncle. Well, did you have a few chores in the dairy business growing up? No. Oh. Yeah, and and we had fun because it was the Mongol community. We had quite a few hired hands that lived right there close because we would uh, we would milk uh, the cows and process the milk and then had have delivery rounds. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, quite a community during the summer during hay season. I think the biggest year was about 23 employees mm -hmm. and a lot of high school kids, you know, during the summer would help. So you learned to drive a tractor pretty young? Uh, probably about eight, uh, you know, eight or ten, you know, when we were, when we could uh, get out there and my granddad showed me how to rake the, rake the hay. Well, were you involved with 4-H or FFA? Uh, uh, somewhat 4-H, uh, but more of FFA in high school. Uh, we had, uh, uh, Dad was a, a World War II veteran, and they, were, they moved to the farm in about 1922, and they saw that they needed to expand just raising crops to milking cows, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of uh, 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 history that's important. My grandmother, Ethy Mungle, was a conservationist, but first it, it was the farm, and she knew that if she could get the judge's wife, Judge Cook, to uh, buy milk from her, uh, from us, then she would have other people buy it and she invited Miss Cook out. She had all of the uh, uh, cheesecloth and straining pads hung out on the clothesline, and Miss Cook said, uh, this is the most sanitary dairy I've ever seen. So that was the name of the dairy up until the uh, probably early 60s when we went into the more modern day of Mungle's Guernsey Farm. <clears throat> And, so the uh, first one was? Sanitary Dairy. Okay. Phone 678. You can whip our cream, but you can't beat our milk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My granddad's saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 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 yeah, my uh, uh, granddad, uh, uh, do you want me to kind of go into sure. that conservation history? Uh, uh, my granddad and grandmother had moved from Arkansas uh, over to Atoka, and uh, 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 during the 20s was uh, the cotton ground was playing out, erosion was taking its course in all of Oklahoma, 
and uh, they got involved in the 30s in the conservation effort. Uh, my granddad was on 1938, I believe, on the Conservation District Board, and my grandmother got involved in the women's auxiliary at that time. Thanks. Oh, Moore, she was known as the Crusading. That's correct. Crusading yeah, Women. and in Senator Robert S. Kerr's book, uh, there's a chapter about my grandmother and granddad and their involvement. And, and, he called her the crusading conservation grandmother. Yeah, uh, Ethy Mungle. She was a big, tall lady, and, and when she was 60, she went back to, about 65, uh, she went back to college at Southeastern in Durant and, and to learn how to do photography. And she had her own dark room, and, and she, we still have a lot of the pictures that she took and processed. Or what were some of the conservation practices they initiated? They well, uh, the early uh, the early days, uh, uh, it was it, it was more that that already been a lot of terracing that had happened, and of course with the dairy you have a lot of manure, and so we used the manure as uh, gully stoppers. Uh, because you could dump a load of manure in the head of a gully and put some Bermuda grass sprigs in it, and by the next season it was healed over. And uh, 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 but we used good farming practices. We had a rotational grazing system uh, for the dairy cows over the years, and uh, uh, I, I remember us having a, a, where the dairy cows would pasture, particularly in the spring at this time or a little bit later, uh, you'd have a diversity of clovers and grasses out there for them to uh, pasture on. And that's when you graduated from high school, would it have been 19... 1966. Uh, yeah, I was in high school, I was in FFA and football, played football and, and uh, um, glee club, those kind of things. I didn't do any other sports. I wasn't the fastest thing in the in the world. But but uh, uh, FFA was a, a big part of my life uh, uh, and continues to be. Uh, but uh, I delivered milk on my junior and senior year door to door on. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday mornings. We'd get up at about 4.30 and, and uh, usually had a, another high school boy that would help me. Sometimes I'd have to go up to Toka about two and a half miles and, and pick him up or whoever it was. Sometimes they had their own car and meet out there and then we'd run a door-to-door -door route and end up at, um, at, a, at a pretty large grocery store at that time and stock up their shelves with milk so uh, they wouldn't run out. All before class, before you got Oh yeah, there, yeah, we'd be, we'd be back home by, by uh, 7.30 and sometimes 7. Just depends on how, usually we had to wait on that store for them to, uh, to open. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And sometimes we'd sneak in our uh, if it snowed, sneak in our our sled and and spend a little time sledding. And Dad would get upset with us, yeah, when he didn't know where we were. But well, did you get paid? Actually, cash paid, or was it? Don't don't remember because we you know day. we always had a little bit of money. My granddad was a banker there in town, and uh, they had moved from Walters, Oklahoma, over there in about 1939 or so, and that's how mother and dad met. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, but uh, um, you know, he always, when I was little, he had put me back in the vault and uh, on Saturday mornings and count pennies in one of those penny machines. and and paid me a dollar, and then he'd take that dollar and put it in my savings account. <laughs> yeah, but 
Yeah, okay. he always bought what I wanted, you know, if it was a toy gun or whatever. Teaching you new lessons early. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I was trying to figure out, so when did they get electric milkers? Because somewhere in there... Uh, we always, always had electric because electric. of uh, processing milk. Um, I, I don't ever remember. We were, uh, it wasn't real electric that we had. They ran the line out from... Uh, uh, public service out of Atoka uh, to us because 6975 Highway was a major interchange north-south across eastern Oklahoma that there was a lot of businesses along that highway and we were only about a half a mile off of it so because of having to cool the milk and you know having the need for electricity every day uh, that uh, I don't ever remember us uh, not having electricity. Mm. And then I have to ask, did they do homemade ice cream? Homemade ice cream? I, well, um, we would for yeah. special occasions, okay. but we didn't. Uh, we didn't have homemade ice cream all the time. Uh, uh, our main was uh, uh, homogenized milk, um, whole milk. Now, uh, coffee cream, whipping cream, and buttermilk. My granddad was a connoisseur of good buttermilk, and so we would have that. And we had, uh, during the summer, uh, during uh, uh, dairy month, which is June, uh, we would have a field day at the house where we'd have 4-H and FFA kids, and then we'd use it while we were processing as an advertising tool. And we would serve 400 people uh, barbecue and all the milk they wanted to drink, not just whole milk, but we made special chocolate milk for that occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't make chocolate milk and, and for the stores or any other thing, but we delivered to the, uh, the uh, schools and uh, uh, nursing homes and of course the grocery store and then door to doors uh, and that was usually what our summer jobs were is uh, taking over other routes that we had or helping other uh, uh, guys that drove the trucks. Kept you pretty busy. Oh all the time. All the time. I mean, you know, it's just part of growing up. So in high school what was your plan for a career? Uh, to come back home to the farm. To the dairy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't going to do anything else. Uh, my granddad was a banker. He was trying to talk me in to go to, to OU, but I knew from early on. Dad was the, uh, in the 60s, he was the president of the Oakland uh, OSU Alumni Association. He didn't graduate uh, OSU uh, because of World War II. Uh, uh, but he, uh, 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 Dr. Bennett, when he got back home from service, he went to see him to go back to school. He had married by that, by that time. And, uh, and Dr. Bennett said, uh, you've got a great heart of Guernsey's and, uh, and go back home uh, and, and develop that. Well, there's a little more to that story. My grandmother was known for her biscuits, big, nice biscuits. And Dr. Bennett was the biscuit champion cooker of Payne County. And, but every time he would come to southeastern Oklahoma, he would make sure my grandmother knew that he was going to be there so he could stop by and get ham and red-eye gravy and biscuits. You know. At her house. But I need to talk about Dad just a little bit. Dad was, uh, he had lost uh, his two brothers in, uh, in accidents uh, in the 30s. Uh, but he went into service and served in Italy, and he has a, a, a silver star uh, for his service. He was a medic because he had Dr. Cattle. And that's what uh, they had him do. But uh, about four years ago, he uh, uh, 
uh, we and we got word that they had found a juvenile mongol dog tag in a uh, a farmer in Italy uh, in the Lye Valley had uh, had turned it up and they were stainless steel back then and um, tried to find it and uh, uh, juvenile mongol which Juban Gene Mongol, they called him Gene Mongol, and they um, uh, we kind of helped us spur on some memory and help help me do a little more research about the battle as they did the push out of uh, NCO Beach. Is when he, uh, but he made it back. Yeah. And didn't he didn't go back to OSU. That's surprising that. Uh -huh. Yeah, professor yeah, would. but uh, uh, Dad didn't need to, you know. He had real close ties with OSU and uh, his whole life. So, of the five children, how many of those went to OSU? Uh, uh, let's see, uh, three of the boys, the girls stayed close to. Or let's see, my Melinda went to East Central, and Margareta went to uh, Tulsa to. Uh, the religious school. Oral Roberts. Uh, Oral Roberts, yeah. And so you went to OSU? I went to OSU. I graduated with a, a BS in animal science, uh, really dairy science at the time. They've done away with that program. But, and what, uh, year, what year did you graduate? Uh, I went up there in 66 uh, and uh, the fall of 66. I, I knew coming from Atoka, I lacked uh, on my education, and uh, and so I would uh, we'd commute down uh, summer school down at Duran at Southeastern, and I would take some of the basics of history and English and and government and English uh, two semesters down there. But I went to OSU in in uh, in the fall of 1966. I graduated with a BS in 1970. Uh, and, was offered assistantship to uh, uh, work on a master's uh, at that time. The uh, 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 Vietnam War was going on, and it's kind of a tough thing for me to remember because I lost friends. But uh, I got in the National Guard and and didn't didn't go uh, to Vietnam um, uh, and went back uh, started I had to do my basic training and tech training in the fall of 1970 and uh, went back they had already started a research project which was doing uh, uh, immunoglobulin transfer in baby calves from the mother cow milk to the baby calves in the first. 48 hours of life, and it was important to me because that's an important part of uh, of a dairy calf's life because you take them off the cow uh, usually within the first 12 hours of their life, and so you want to make sure that uh, they get that immunity. They don't get it across the placenta like like hogs and and, uh, and humans beings, uh, they have to get it from the milk. Yeah. So once you graduated, you went back to the, to the, mm -hmm. to the dairy business? I knew I'd go back. Uh, uh, I was in the uh, Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity up there and, uh, you know, I had a lot of my friends they, uh, that would, you know, their intention was going back to the farm across Oklahoma because it's an agriculture fraternity. I have some friends did stay in agriculture, but to get initiated, you had to be in agriculture uh, school. And um, um, still got we had our 50th uh, anniversary of the initiation class last fall uh, up there, which was uh, good, and nearly everybody came, mm -hmm. and there was a few that didn't, but. Uh, 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 get the masters gave me a whole new look at uh, at uh, well research 
uh, number one, but also more uh, in-depth look at, um, at um, the biosciences and and then applied nutrition uh, in uh, in cattle and and other livestock, but mainly in cattle, ruminant cattle is you know where I kind of focused on. Um, Biochemistry was kind of a game changer. I didn't do great in it, but I hadn't done really well in the other earlier chemistries during undergraduate. But biochemistry, I told my my uh, professor that uh, that should have been taught before the other chemistries because that put all the other chemistries together. Uh, but that and didn't do well in ag statistics, but that was the beginning of the computers with the punch cards and those kind of things. And uh, uh, ag statistics was, was very important uh, and I learned the basics about it, which all of those things were very valuable in life. Going forward. You're going forward, yeah. Well, at what point did you get involved with the conservation district there in Atoka? Um, about that same time. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I found unusual with our family is uh, my granddad and grandmother were really involved in conservation, uh, but dad wasn't. He uh, OSU things and uh, one was in uh, lines and the other one was in rotary and we it, it kind of instilled a dividing up you know in, uh, community activity uh, in things. Well uh, my granddad uh, had got on the board uh, in 38 I think that's uh, about the year that uh, Atoka uh, County was formed and uh, uh, after getting back home from uh, college I was I, I was on a run all the time and I was asked we had we uh, in the 60s we had built a new dairy barn and processing uh, facility that tied everything together uh, cows came in and were milked and went into a tank and in the next room and then the next room was the processing where we, uh, uh, we clarified and standardized milk and then and then pasteurized it or and bottled it or cartoned it or you know whatever we had to do but um, um, it was uh, uh, a time that uh, I was, you know, had all these ideas and was uh, was not thinking about conservation, and we were having to put in a, a waste handling system for the for the dairy, and we had a had a technician. I've been trying to remember the technician's name, but he was a technician at the conservation district and had been there for quite a long time, and. And I was out with him, helping him survey and telling him, you know, making sure I understood what he had in mind of how we were going to handle it through a lagoon system. And he said, Mason, you need to get on the Conservation District Board. And I told him, I said, well, I just don't have time. I'm in a hurry, you know, <laughs> doing other things. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this. But, uh, the district conservationist didn't want me on the board because my granddad was always a very active member and the D DC at that time didn't want anybody that, that pushed or uh, got outside of what box he wanted the district to to be involved with. So it was several years before um, before I uh, uh, got on the board. I think 
78 or something, 1978. So I'd been home six years or so before uh, I put my name in. To, and we were farming a lot, a lot of ground, and because we raised a lot of the the forage for the uh, the dairy, we didn't raise any grain. We bought the grain. And it takes a lot when you're milking 200 head of Guernseys uh, uh, two times a day that you have to you have to feed them uh, the right rations in order to achieve the best milk production for them. And uh, we had a bull that Dad had got um, in the early 60s. His name was uh, Mongol Sabian Saturn. Dad had bought the, the dam and sire, and uh, this was, uh, uh, a, a, he won lots of shows as a young bull, and then he was uh, the first uh, all-American aged bull uh, west of the Mississippi River. It was kind of a breakout of the Guernsey breed, uh, because it was pretty consolidated up in the uh, the northeast uh, part of the United States. That bull was a, a really good bull, um, and type-wise and production-wise. And so, he, uh, uh, showing had started uh, all the way up into the Midwest, Minnesota, Nebraska, uh, all over. And you know, I think in the eighth grade, I went to the uh, the uh, World Dairy Congress in Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, rode a truck, first time I'd ever seen Kansas City, and I was in the back of a semi, because that's, you know, back then they didn't have big sleepers, and, and the, the herdsman would ride up in front, and he'd just put us back with the cattle in the back. And this would have been in late September, early October, so it was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, the first time I ever saw Kansas City was through the slats of a, the back of a semi. <laughs> <laughs> Being, you, you probably find out more than what you <laughs> But it, it was, uh, uh, you know, we showed a lot and uh, uh, we were premier breeder several times during the time that I, uh, 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 I guess when I was there is when we got home from the uh, uh, from college that we started really improving because of artificial insemination and going with other bulls and mating and and, and things. Um, production kept per cow kept going up, uh, plus uh, the quality of the animals, and we were premier breeder, I think three or four times at the national show mm -hmm. and, and we sold good cattle. We started having a production sale. So there was a lot of things that was going on plus, you know, raising the, uh, the feed and forage. But the conservation uh, uh, district gave me a look at how organizations worked on a volunteer basis uh, as a conservation district director. Uh, my granddad had been very involved in the upstream flood control prog uh, program, um, mainly locally but statewide. Uh, he was a big fan of Robert S. Kerr, uh, and Kerr was a water man. And uh, how do we, and land, uh, in his book, Land, Wood, and Water, uh, uh, you can tell from that book the importance of those resources are to him personally and then the state and the nation. And so, <clears throat> uh, so I, I, I didn't pay any attention to it too much. My granddad, sometime in there, took me on a tour. They had a, they had a, uh, over at Ada, they had a national, uh, uh, it, it was probably the old Watershed Conference, uh, Congress that met over there and they did a tour 
of these upstream flood controls. Well, in Atoka County, we had quite a few upstream flood controls, and it was sponsored by the district in, uh, 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 with, uh, at that time, Soil Conservation Service building the, uh, the structures. The districts would uh, acquire the easements uh, uh, for the from the landowner to uh, build those upstream flood controls and they were most of them were small you know 10 acres or less of, of permanent pool but uh, and we had one over it uh, we farmed uh, about a hundred about 200 acres over Wapanucka about 20 miles in Johnson County and we had one on us uh, on the Delaware Creek watershed so I I started understanding watersheds, and and uh, which gave me a good background later on. And your your grandfather took you, gave you a tour. You were saying? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, uh, it was part of that. Uh, probably an old watershed congress meeting because I remember they had a whole lot of people in a big big feed uh, at at this site, and there was some prominent people there, a friend that we knew, Ben and I knew, Walt Woolley that was on the district board down at, down at Ada, and uh, he was a great conservationist and, and a good businessman there in Pontotoc County. But uh, uh, I, 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 that kind of helped me start understanding uh, uh, the reason for upstream flood control. So you served at the same time as your granddad, at least a little no, bit of an overlap? No, no, no uh, he no got, he, uh, when my grandmother passed away in uh, 65 or so, and that's when he, uh, he was on the uh, district board and on the commission. He had got on the original commission. If you don't know this, OSU, <coughs> uh, Oklahoma A&M, that was the sponsor of the commission in Oklahoma and they wouldn't let new ideas come in and break away from the norm of you know like extension and, and they wanted to run it like extension <clears throat> and in uh, the late 40s, uh, there was a move by probably some of the, uh, the original board members to say, uh, uh, Conservation District Board, we need a state agency of our own. Now that's a history that I don't know too much about or can't remember, I'm sure I've read it. But, uh, so the uh, Oklahoma Conservation Commission was formed and he was one of the first uh, commissioners from southeast Oklahoma. There was five commissioners, um, southeast, northeast, central, northwest, and southwest. But when grandmother passed away, uh, it was time for him to get off and, and he got replaced on, uh, on the commission and then got off of the board too. So it, well, that would have been what about 13 years between that time. Okay, let's back up a little bit and talk about high school and, and FFA. Tell us a little bit more. Uh, FFA was a major part of my life, uh, uh, and and still is. My grand, my dad, uh, Gene Mungle, he was a uh, uh, state president in uh, like 1939 and 40. Uh, and his officer team was uh, uh, was pretty progressive in in doing things, and I always wanted to follow his lead in in FFA. <clears throat> but uh, we had uh, a great chapter. had a had a lot of. Uh, I was considered a city boy, even though we were out of town, because in. In southeast Oklahoma, if you're outside the uh, uh, the city limits, uh, particularly east, uh, it, it was pretty tough living out there. Uh, usually, uh, forestry and cattle were the main sources of in, uh, uh, in the eastern part of Atoka County. 
but I had a great, several great uh, teachers, but had a, uh, a new young uh, uh, FFA advisor and uh, L.D. Smith, and he s still lives down at uh, Pulse Valley now. Uh, don't see him too often, but he helped, helped me develop my leadership skills, and, uh, and it was natural for me to run for uh, Southeast District uh, Vice President of the FFA Association, Oklahoma Association, and I won. And um, uh, that was in the spring of 66. And uh, so I was going to OSU and uh, involved up there uh, and then ran for state president the next spring in 67. And me and another uh, guy from Snyder, Oklahoma, Johnny McElroy, was running. And back then, uh, uh, Eastern chapters, which I knew I had pretty well solid, in running for uh, state president, they, they didn't have the money to go to Stillwater to the uh, state convention. But Western Oklahoma, they nearly 100% of their chapters uh, were would come. And I lost it in a very close vote and uh, I think that instilled in me, I really never ran for another, felt comfortable about running for another office uh, until recently, but, but uh, it, it, uh, it didn't, didn't suppress my appetite for FFA and after I got home from college, uh, when I showed cattle in high school, beef cattle, uh, we showed at sale barn, and we didn't have a county fair barn. And one of the things I wanted to do is to have a county fair barn, and there was other uh, guys in the community that wanted it. And now, I, when I came by there yesterday, I noticed that they're preparing for the for the spring stock show, and and. Uh, makes me feel good that uh, things came together during, not because of me, but because of all of us working together. Uh, in it. And that would have been, oh, early 80s, you know, 1980s. Uh, and then uh, uh, other things, I go to the FFA convention and we have get-togethers of the officers uh, that have served uh, in the state organization and then going. I was an American farmer <clears throat> in about, uh, I think the fall, let's see, uh, fall of 1968, and I had a fraternity brother that was an American farmer at that time, and his dad and my dad were American farmers at the same time back in the 40s, so that was kind of unique. Mm -hmm. and I, see Don Kirby every once in a while we talk about it. Uh, That's been 50 years ago if I'm doing my math. 68. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 It was uh, it was uh, it was good and being an American farmer and then later on uh, when I went in one of my jobs as a lobbyist and working well through the conservation I uh, uh, I, it was an honorary American farmer degree, so um, really that was should have been Dad's, you know, because he was. We had dairy days at the farm for forty years before he died. So. What did you have? Other influential people in your life besides L.D. L.D. Smith? I mean, oh yeah, hey, uh, going OSU? going to OSU. Uh, my advisor, Linville Bush, was. Uh, very much a part of, of uh, you know, helping direct me and, and getting an assistantship with farmland to uh, to do my master's work. And then Dr. Wagner uh, was applied nutrition, and he was a great instructor and uh, and brought all the sciences together to uh, help you develop the best rations for whatever. Uh, species of animals that you were working with. Was the dairy barn still there 
was it operation? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I, I, I had an office in there. That's where my graduate office was. It was just right down the hall from the dairy bar, and uh, uh, there was. Uh, there was an older guy from California that was Portuguese and uh, uh, that had come to do his, I don't know whether it was a, a doctorate or a, a, or a master's there, it may have been a doctorate, uh, but he was Portuguese and we talked about linguisa and uh, the Portuguese uh, he called them Portuguese, uh, Port uh, Portugal uh, uh, natives, but uh, those people, uh, you know, uh, uh, still, I think Linville, uh, Dr. Bush has uh, passed away, but they're, you know, good friends and uh, helped me, helped me a lot. Well, how often would you go home when, while you were out on campus uh, as a uh, freshman? Uh, 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 you know, early on, I'd go home as much as we had. I had an older brother that was up there, mm -hmm. so we shared a car. He kept it most of the time, but but um, uh, we would uh, we would go back to Atoka and. And of course, family get-togethers of Thanksgiving and Christmas are very important. And then summers uh, were working back on the farm. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't any working out. Uh, you went back to the farm and worked. No working off the farm. <laughs> no, I, I think the first our farm job I had was hauling watermelons out of the field, and, <laughs> and that was. But we were high school kids and full of them and get bigger and, and <laughs> yeah, it was it was good. But uh, uh, so, how long were you in the dairy business? You uh, well, we uh, we uh, quit processing in 1978, and uh, uh, and we kept milking cows. We just shipped to a, a co-op, um, uh, AMPI. And uh, we kept selling raw milk out because we had processed milk. We came under a grandfather statue, so we had raw milk, you know, and we would sell it in jugs. And we had places that we could get the plastic gallon jugs, and we just sold it in gallons. And there was about that much cream on top of it, so it was. We, you know, we had a had a good. Uh, clientele of people uh, and gave us a little cash spending money too. Yeah. Well, regulations, I guess, helped make that decision. As the uh, and yeah, and, and and really the you know the seventies with high interest rates mm -hmm. and we had to cut back and about that time the gas price started going up and so the economics of uh, of a small dairy and then we had some larger competitors come in. Kind of forced, you know. Our hand, Dad came up one day and said, "Let's quit processing." And I said, "You know, that sounds good to me." Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, FFA conservation, uh, all of those things have been instilled as part of my life um, throughout. But uh, going back to the conservation district. Uh, uh, in in uh, uh, 1982, the uh, uh, the Kellogg Foundation started a uh, uh, Oklahoma Ag Leadership Program or uh, a leadership program for the nation. Probably several years uh, before that uh, in other states, but Oklahoma created that uh, through OSU. And uh, uh, my dairy uh, guys up at OSU said, well, you need to put in for it. And uh, I said, I don't have time. I've got too many things going. And they said, well, we've already put your application in. You just need to do a bio and send it in. And, uh, and it was uh, always uh, a look at life that um, uh, you're at home on the farm, 
even though I showed cattle nationally and got outside the yard fence, the Oklahoma Ag Leadership Program really let me see a super highway right outside the fence. And uh, uh, it was a two year program with a national emphasis the first year, state and national, and then international the second with a, a trip to China. Uh, on the, the, at the end of the first year, we, we went to Washington, D.C. as a group, and there was 30 young guys that, uh, I mean, we were meeting people that we would, I'd go home and tell Dad who would talk to us, and he'd say it'd take me 30 years to meet those kind of people. And coming out of one congressman's office, I met this um, tall gentleman, and it was the same week that the Conservation uh, Commission and the OACD had gone to Washington to uh, do their uh, annual visits on Capitol Hill. And uh, this gentleman was Hal Clark, of which you're going to interview. And uh, uh, and then others that was that were involved at that time, and that would have been in probably about 1982. Um, and Hal remembers that to this day, uh, that meeting, you know, me young guy and with other young guys and seeing all these people, first time in Washington D.C. and 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 stuff, but. Uh, uh, but as I got in more involved in conservation, then I uh, uh, was able to be a vice president of this, from the southeast of the Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts. <coughs> and uh, at one of those meetings, well, uh, uh, the director said, Mason, would you consider being a commissioner? And this would have been in uh, 84 or 85, somewhere along in there. And I said, uh, well, I guess, you know, what, what does it do? You know, because my granddad didn't talk about it uh, very much of being the commissioner on the Conservation Commission. But Leonard Solomon knew my granddad, and so did other people uh, that were active in conservation at that time. <clears throat> and so uh, 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 he said, well, this, uh, this uh, George Wagner's going to get beat uh, because of some local issues over in, uh, in Haskell County. And uh, if the governor's down there at that time, Governor Knight, well, you need to kind of be in front of him. Well, my dad and his friends in Toka County were uh, Democrats and, and uh, pretty active, and so uh, I wasn't known, but Dad was. So they would, uh, any time the governor was in the area, I'd pick him up at the airport and haul him to whatever it was. So I would, he got to know me and get, got to know me, and. Uh, and, and so George Wagner got beat, and I was immediately nominated to go on the commission and got approved in what, uh, uh, spring of 1985. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I had got acquainted with other people with OACD and, and, uh, and things, and so started making commission meetings. And then uh, just in that fall of 1985, uh, uh, Solomon, after one of the meetings, came up to me and said, uh, I'm going to retire here in a couple of months, uh, and, uh, or the end of the year, whatever it was. And he said, uh, uh, you'd be somebody good to take my place. Well, I never thought about leaving the farm. Uh, you know, I was, I was trained milk cows and uh, I was trying to you know understand crop production and all of those kind of things and I went back home and told dad and he said we well, ought to think about it and milk was at a really low 
point, and we were struggling financially, milking a lot of cows, but really struggling. And <clears throat> uh, and so I put my application in, and was selected to be the director of the Conservation Commission in January of 1986. And is that a salaried position? That's a salaried yeah. position, the most money Not I've volunteer. ever made in my life. <laughs> <laughs> my wife and I, she had uh, moved to Norman and I, uh, and we'd kind of split up and at that time I, I thought, well, you know, that was another thing, maybe we could get back together and make it work. It didn't work, but, but uh, it, uh, it, uh, it gave me the opportunity to see, see state government action. So you would have, would you still live in Atoka and drive in or? No, I lived, lived in Norman lived in and, Norman. you know, on Friday after work, well, I'd stop by there and uh, pick up my bag and go to the farm. Mm -hmm. Or what were some of the things you would do in that role <laughs> as director? <laughs> well, a lot of things. Uh, First day on the job, I have to tell, tell this because it's an important part of understanding politics uh, and state government. Um, I was there at 8 o'clock at the opening in, of the office and meeting everybody and of course I knew everybody there, but uh, we get a call about mid-morning from the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and for me to come over there at three o'clock. So I go over to uh, Representative Roland Reimer's office. You know how names stick with you because it was a major point. I knew a little bit about what I was walking into, but not the extent. There had been some special money put with the commission to buy three fire trucks or uh, put in uh, with three communities uh, in Oklahoma uh, uh, for three fire trucks, one at Cold Cord and one at um, Ho uh, Holbert and then another community in western Oklahoma. And it was $100,000 or something like that. Well, this kept escalating and I told him, I said, well, this is my first day and I've yet to find out all of the all of the appropriations uh, and the uh, the budget of the commission, and the commissioners had been informed about this, or I, I informed them that uh, we needed to buy these fire trucks, and they didn't like it. Uh, as long as I was there, uh, we could not find where that hundred thousand dollars was put, but. That spring, we were threatened of the commission being put over with the Department of Agriculture by the Speaker of the House. Luckily, uh, Senator Roy Boatner, <coughs> from my senator from Matoka, was chairman of the Senate Appropriations uh, Subcommittee on Natural Resources. And so I would keep him informed of the problems we were having over in the House. And so uh, uh, we ended up and committed to buy the fire trucks and uh, Senator Boatner put in the $100,000 uh, for that appropriation bill to be able to cost share on that. And really is what happened, that was the early stages of rural fire departments. And um, uh, after that, uh, we would get money to, uh, to put in uh, uh, two real, rural fire departments that we all knew were very important to rural uh, areas. Um, I started under Governor George Nye. It was last of his uh, two terms as governor and Senator Henry Bellman had got elected as uh, governor for the second time. And uh, um, 
I, I think, you know, we just kept our heads down and there wasn't a change in my job. I, we just kept doing what we did best and that was uh, conservation. And uh, uh, four years with uh, Senator Bellman and then uh, four years with uh, uh, Walters and uh, Got lots of stories about that four years, and then uh, and then four years with uh, in Keating's first uh, uh, first four years, and then I left in the fall. Uh, I guess when he after he had got elected to go to another job, but. Uh, 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 Governor Bellman knew of a lot of line item uh, special projects and so he changed things and instead of being told where to these rural fire departments we were to spend the special money that we got, uh, we had to take applications and any fire, rural fire department that didn't say that they would fight rural fi or wildfires they didn't get funded, and those that did would get funded for it. But in all of that trading, we kept improving our budget. Uh, you know, we would horse trade and Ben Pollard and uh, Mike Castle were in the uh, abandoned mine land program that had started, what was that, in 82 or right that. Uh, 1982, where they reclaimed uh, coal mines, uh, mainly in eastern Oklahoma, some in the token, Coal County. Uh, we had a lot of cave-ins from the old uh, underground mines that uh, during wet and dry years, the top would come out. One of, one of them I remember well, it was right behind the courthouse in Colgate. And it was a hole about six foot wide at the top and about 30 feet deep and about 50 feet across and it's like a mushroom that uh, and they got in there and, and uh, covered it and, and stuff that was one program the other program was uh was a water quality uh program and john hassel was uh, was over that program and uh uh, it is. It had followed the uh, 1985, uh, well, 1985 and 1987. 85 was a, a farm bill which changed uh, 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 highly erodible. Started uh, making classification to highly erodible land. And then 87 or right in there, maybe it was 82, uh, Clean Water Act was passed and, and uh, we did a lot of non-point uh, uh, testing of water quality across the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, through the effort of those type of programs, plus the normal conservation activities of watershed program, I found out I got there and we had $200,000 in a watershed uh, revolving account that apparently my granddad had helped set up when he was at the commission to help districts <coughs> on upstream flood controls. If we have some landowners say, I'm not going to sign an easement, I'm not going to give you anything, uh, but I'll sell you the land. The districts didn't have the money, but that account would buy the land and then turn the land over to the districts to manage uh, uh, that that land, and so uh, uh, that was an important account because it was used, you know, through the years to kind of shore up. And then uh, uh, one of the things we didn't put down was the roadside erosion program. We had districts that uh, had good relationship with the uh, county commissioners and we were able to get funding uh, to cost share <coughs> through the conservation districts for for roadside erosion projects with the county commissioners uh, at the lower level uh, at the local levels but uh, going back to uh, 
AML and, and uh, water quality. Um, those guys, you know, they were dealing with having to go out and survey those sites or put uh, water monitoring stations back on creeks that uh, they didn't know exact location and we were in competition with the Water Resource Board in some of those activities and we needed better information about that watershed and the location of those monitoring stations. And John had a lot of uh, high tech -y kind of guys there that, uh, for that time in, in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, it's really basic now. But we saw the need for uh, GIS uh, uh, global positioning uh, use and uh, we found out more and, and I went to a conference and happened to uh, be there with the kind of the founding father of GIS, uh, Esri system, <coughs> and uh, uh, somehow we got uh, the state geographer uh, there, uh, Springer, wasn't it? Bob Springer. Bob Springer. And uh, so it was just kind of, all of it was kind of coming together and Governor Walters had come in and picked Patty Eaton as the Secretary of uh, Environment and uh, from Tulsa. <clears throat> and uh, we were really pushing for more GIS uh, uh, coordination between state agencies because we were, were using one system, Water Board was using one, Office of Emergency Management was using one at that time. DEQ was formed, they were using another one, and we weren't coordinating all of that information together. And so I told the Secretary of Ag, Gary Shearer, I said, if she doesn't do anything by the next legislative session, well, we're going to get a bill passed. That the commission will be the uh, chair of the GIS Council and what in a funded position <clears throat> and the, the, the focus of that was for all the agencies or even counties uh, uh, to sit down at the table and share information and try to get some coordination of a common language that they were going to put all of their information on. And Oh, all hell broke loose in, in cabinet meetings when Patty Eaton found out about that, but we got the bill passed and, and the council is still active and has done just great things and uh, we're able to know if there was a, uh, a, a an old mine on the up above Podo that they could go in global positioning that mine and be able to record it or the water quality guys could put their information in, and uh, use the global positioning to know where their stations were and then they could share that with the other agencies to uh, uh, in a common mapping format. Okay, let's back up and, and uh, can you tell us anything else about Governor Bellman? Uh, yes, he was the second governor I uh, served under, and uh, uh, we had to kind of change the way we did business. Uh, we retained our uh, most of our uh, commissioners at that time. We had one replacement because usually the governor would uh, uh, the commissioners were on there for I believe three years, and and then uh, you know you'd have some change between governors. Uh, one of the things that Gov Governor Bellman saw was the lack of uh, education of the agency heads and supervisors. And uh, he had a two-day program that uh, uh, put agency heads together and uh, how to do an interview. Um, some of basic things about human resource and uh, people management. Um, 
and, and it really wasn't political at all. Uh, in fact, was he had a Democrat from uh, down in Texas come up and train us of how to do interviews and uh, to correct uh, if you were stated wrong in the paper is <clears throat> to uh, make sure that you corrected that or called the interviewer and, and uh, do those kind of things. But it's what happened after that was, uh, was um, you know, you always have, always have some employees that are problems and uh, uh, we were immune to that. And uh, it opened up the door to uh, uh, have the supervisors of each of the different programs go through uh, uh, human resource. And one of the first ones was corrective discipline, because uh, we have two employees that needed, we were struggling with. And, and uh, uh, that took us on every year, uh, well, the first couple of years as, as the director I, I selected them. And the first one was corrective discipline, and I learned throughout my work life of how to deal with problem employees or correct them and, and stuff. And then we, and then after the first couple of years, then we would let the uh, other supervisors pick what course they wanted, and we would all meet at the Votech and <clears throat> away from the office and have a, con a contract with somebody to do that training one day training and uh, usually we were done by three o'clock so we could get back to the office for an hour and a half or so before uh, the day shut down. So uh, that was one thing that uh, Henry Bellman did. Uh, 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 Governor Walters, there was a myriad of different things. Uh, uh, as we talked about the 87 Clean Water Act amendments, uh, kind of put uh, the commission as the lead on non-point source water quality. And uh, during Walter's time, <clears throat> there was uh, the uh, health department was trying to split off into environmental and really health issues. And uh, that was um, a time, I don't remember the dates of that, that the legislature created the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ. And uh, 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 we, there was a lot of negotiation because we wanted to keep or expand our jurisdiction as conservation uh, programs were concerned. And so I was able to cut some deals that solidified our non-point source uh, uh, seat at the table with other agencies and because we had local people out there and we wanted to do cost share programs uh, for non-point source uh, from uh, nutrients to sediment uh, and those were big issues uh, back then. Uh, let's kind of go into the watershed program, the National Watershed Program. I assume I, I talked earlier about the Watershed Congress, and I knew a little bit about that, but in the 70s, because the environmental movements and keep free-flowing streams still out there, that uh, uh, a lot of the watershed uh, programs were getting harder to get, uh, get built. Uh, because the Soil Conservation Service would do surveys of watersheds, particularly if there was a city involved uh, for flooding and, uh, and even uh, municipal industrial water. And then it died out. And we knew that there needed to be some national group that would put all states together where we would work together and and try to start the program back up and put emphasis on the importance of uh, flood control and then water quality, nutrient control, sediment control, and streams and rivers. <clears throat> and 
we were at an NACD meeting over in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and we didn't want the, the feds to know what we were doing. We went into a broom closet, and there was about four or five of us uh, from other states, and we had talked about it. We formed the uh, Watershed Coalition, and it's still Dan Siebert. I don't know whether you interviewed Dan, but uh, he's... Uh, and also during that time, dam safety issues came in, <clears throat> because we did have some dams that uh, were above cities or above housing additions, and uh, we were being forced to uh, to bring some of these dams up to standard, and there wasn't very much federal money and a lot of other things, trees on the dams that would uh, uh, question the integrity of some of these pretty large upstream flood controls. So the, there was a, a raft of, of things that were going on, but there wasn't a coordinating group. And so that's, we started the, the uh, National Watershed Coalition. And, uh, you know, when you do things that, that are right to do and you have people that have the same shared ideas, then you can kind of move ahead on stuff. It's your leadership skills from your FFA, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> Not really. And then, and then the elite ag leadership, uh, you know, of understanding the bigger picture of agriculture sure. and, and stuff. But uh, it's um, uh, watershed program was uh, uh, was and still is an important part of Oklahoma's uh, uh, conservation effort because. Uh, it's provided uh, water to uh, communities across the state, it's provided flood control, it's provided irrigation, it's provided water for water and cattle. Um, recreation, you know, you can just go on and on, wildlife habitat, um, all those. I have to tell a story, and I'm not sure, and this is kind of hearsay, I could not ever get anybody to substantiate this, but we had some great leaders prior to me in the watershed program. And down in Carter County, the Arbuckle Conservation District, they had, uh, instead of getting the commission to provide the money to buy a landowner out, <clears throat> they went together, the five board members, and bought this track of land and built a cabin on it and they would have their district meetings out there at that cabin. Now, I don't know if they were officially uh, uh, posted uh, at the courthouse uh, or not, but they would have uh, uh, meetings, have people uh, from Washington, D.C. and from the Soil Conservation Service and, of course, probably a local congressman. And uh, these were guys that were very progressive and aggressive uh, in their businesses and in the conservation program. And they saw the importance, of, they knew the importance of the, the uh, watershed program, the flood control, but there was nothing done in the watersheds above those uh, dams for land treatment. And so they talked the Soil Conservation Service and Congress to fund a, a cost share program to do land treatment in those watersheds that reduce the sediment load in those and you know it was a, it was a win-win for everybody but they would have those those meetings at that uh, cabin down there on that uh, watershed and if you drive down I-35 you'll see June the, Gene Neustadt Lake, uh, that's a watershed and uh, water uh, system, I mean water storage for uh, Ardmore. Uh, Gene Neustadt was one of those directors. Scott Keane, and Creed Speaks, and, you know, guys that, you know, were real, well respected and stuff. In fact, we had a new program, and Gene Neustadt was, uh, uh, 
a very uh, uh, big businessman, uh, and he had a Newstead building in Ardmore. And when there was a new program that was being talked about, I would go down there and I'd say, "Now, Gene, here's what some would want to do, and I'd like to do." And, and then we would talk about it and see if it kind of hit the mustard on different things. Uh, Let's see, we were going to talk about education, uh, on conservation education. Uh, when I got there, there was al al already an effort to, uh, uh, to have education programs for schools, uh, for, uh, you know, kindergarten through 12. And uh, uh, Project Wild was a really, uh, uh, joint effort between the wildlife department and conservation. And one of the things that Dan Siebert and, and uh, Ben Pollard and others uh, stressed was you, who's going to do that education? Well, it's the teachers in the schools that are going to do it. So make sure that you have teachers on any type of an education program that you came up with. and. Uh, that helped later on to make sure that we had involvement because after Project Wild was up and going, then we had Project Blue Thumb well, on water quality that that was formed and formed the same way where you had teachers that uh, that were part of uh, the curriculum uh, for those programs. So it, you know, all of those kind of things uh, uh, have expanded and gotten national, national recognition uh, to A lot of good things. Oh yeah, yeah. And we were going to dis discuss uh, benefits for district employees. Oh okay. <clears throat> uh, the conservation districts uh, usually have uh, uh, two employees at that time, sometimes more than that. Uh, the secretary, uh, when I got there, was half-time federal and half-time state or local, and we would provide that uh, uh, that money to the districts for their half of that secretary. <clears throat> Shortly after I got there, there was a budget crunch and the feds decided their half-time districts uh, secretaries were where they could use that money someplace else. Uh, if the district secretary, uh, they had some benefits through the feds, but not much. And so it became aware to us as state employees, we had health and retirement benefits. Why wouldn't these district employees have? And we would contract uh, for the AML program through a district and here Ben Pollard and Mike Castle were in the office, they didn't have benefits, and us as state employees did. <clears throat> and uh, we had a great Speaker of the House, Steve Lewis from over at Shawnee, and the district manager at Shawnee were good, was good friends with him and talked to him about getting benefits, and he called me over there and said, we need to do this, but we need local support to do it. So we had a lot of the district secretaries and district employees come in, and and we got them uh, uh, health insurance and retirement and uh, was able to use all of that and boost their salary a little bit too and take that other half of the, uh, of the money that the feds had withdrawn. Well, I know it, it was for a while state, local, and federal, right? Like, yeah. like corporate extension. Yeah, the three, mm -hmm. three. right. Right. Uh, uh, the, the local is the conservation district, the state is the commission, and then the Fed is the okay. SCS or now NRCS. Uh, we had different uh, state conservationists that sometimes they worked with us real well and other times they wanted to be just like that old district conservationist. They didn't want anybody else in their business. Uh, while I was at the commission, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, uh, 
there was a, a forum before I got there, uh, National Association of State Conservation Agencies, NASDA, and uh, uh, as SCS started separating from that local direction, we saw that we knew to have stronger voice and so we solidified the National Association of Conservation District Power Agencies uh, because that's where most of those local funds came through is the state agency down to the local level. <clears throat> and uh, I was served as president, I was the vice president and the president had and it was from New York and had some other things to do and so really I served instead of two years, I served three years as the national president of that organization. We were able to solidify that as a real outspoken group with, I believe, uh, we, we signed a mutual agreement during my term there of uh, stronger cooperation between the state and uh, local districts uh, during that time. So it was, uh, you know, those kind of things you have to learn how to kind of put pressure on them. And, and uh, it was a time that we needed a solidified effort in the conservation programs. Yeah. Long days. I'm thinking to myself, you you were thinking doing work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Something I, I, like that. But it wasn't that way because you, you were working with people with the same attitude, and uh, uh, you know, plus going out and visiting conservation districts. First time I ever had a uh, what's that what's that German sandwich that they put beer ox. <clears throat> it was at the uh, Harper County, uh, no, let's see, Buffalo, Harper County Conservation District. I went up there and they said, we've got a treat for you today. We've got beer off. I thought, what? Well, beer off? And uh, they put hamburger and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, cabbage and, and onions together and cook that and then put it inside a roll and cook all of that. And it's, it's, Quite a, good. But it, it is good. I, I've had it several times since. But <clears throat> uh, you know, or uh, you know, I went down to one of the commissioners was from down at Mangum uh, in Greer County, and I would go down there, and, and uh, he talked pretty plain to you if he didn't like something was going on. Well, I'd go down there and listen to what his problems. Was with the commission and what we were doing. Try uh, smooth ruffled feathers. Yeah, uh, and, and one thing Leonard Grauman uh, uh, didn't uh, really particularly care for was to educate district directors more. And uh, we tried to get a, a, a district director education program going, and, and he was old school and. Um, and, you know, consolidation of power and stuff. But uh, finally, he, he saw the benefit as we had directors changing uh, during my time. I think when I got uh, at the commission, we only had uh, three or four district directors that were female. And we got more per, plus a diversification on boards uh, during that time. And, uh, women added a whole lot of diversity to it. We had a, uh, a commissioner, uh, uh, we had two commissioners that were um, uh, female uh, while I was on there. Sandra Drummond comes to mind, is that? That's she, correct, she one of yeah, them? yeah. Uh, she was, uh, had been widowed and, and uh, uh, from the Drummond family up in Osage County and ran a pretty large uh, a stalker uh, and a smaller cow calf operation up there. Was that hard to adjust to having a, a, a female? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I, I made a I made it a habit to uh, when I got a new commissioner. 
to go to their house to I wanted to see, if I had to call them and I wanted to see where they were sitting and what they were thinking about or you know other distractions that they may have and I went to Sandra's house up there and they were gathering uh, bulls out of some cows and uh, I was out there on the horse helping them uh, with that and, and, and you know Sandra was just a wonderful uh, addition to the commission uh, and then Virginia Kidd came on later on she had different skills than uh, what Sandra had, but um, it's, you know, it, it added benefit and we had some districts that were stuck in the mud and you'd get a female on the board that was ready to go gun hole and they'd take off. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, let's see, we're, we've kind of gone through all of that. The 85 Farm Bill was a turning point of a lot of things in conservation districts. And the, uh, they classified highly erodible land. We had land classes. We, Oklahoma had uh, early on done a soils book and had these, each county had these great soils book and, and had the soil classes on an aerial photo that had been done locally. I mean, I can imagine the effort that went into sampling and, and then updating that. Uh, and now through the GIS program, it's all digitized. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to print the books out. They can just bring it up on the computer. On the map, within a uh, one meter accuracy of, uh, of where the soils change in different Areas. But the 85 Farm Bill uh, uh, started the Conservation Reserve Program. And uh, there was some highly erodible lands in eastern Oklahoma, but a lot of western Oklahoma. And uh, uh, crop prices were low in, the, in that period of time in the late 80s, early 90s. And, uh, they were needing to reduce the stocks of wheat and corn and wheat and corn maybe. Uh, so they paid farmers to plant uh, grass cover crop, uh, grass for uh, 10 year uh, contracts and then expand on those. And you'll hear from Hal Clark, uh, uh, some districts that uh, that helped farmers sow the seed and traded in the seed uh, did really well and was able to uh, to have money at the local level to build their own building instead of relying on the county for the buildings and provide equipment for the, uh, for uh, seeding and all other types of, uh, of practices that you couldn't afford to buy that has a farmer that specialized equipment. So that was 85 Farm Bill is, and then there was different changes to the Farm Bill after that that created the Wetlands Reserve and uh, other type of things. Uh, we, <coughs> we had a we had a, an agreement with soil conservation in our CES and we got one of the employees and he was a soils expert, Jim Henley. Plus, he had skills of uh, mapping, which folded right into GIS. And they have taken that and now they can tell if there's going to be a heavy rainfall event in a particular watershed in order for the district employees to go out and check that watershed if it's going to overflow the emergency spillway. Just on and on when the GIS program, Mike Sharps, uh, over that now when the, the second Moore tornado came in, they uh, took their information, aerial photos, down to the uh, the uh, emergency management center and 
uh, help get the logistics about getting into that tornado path and hauling out trash, uh, the, the trash. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then when President Obama came in, they were part of uh, providing all of the logistics for the Secret Service for his safety as he came in to it. Just, you know, you, the programs that you start out at a basic level, but you know that there's things that are good to happen with it, and it takes good people to do that. And the average citizen doesn't have a clue with all, oh, this, no. all this behind no, the scenes they, going on. No, but when they get in their car, the mapping system comes right up on there. <laughs> Where did that come from? You know, one of the things you haven't talked about is who I had as district as uh, employees at the commission, mm -hmm. and um, uh, had when I got there, I had an assistant director, Robert Toole, and he left. And uh, there was a lady that had worked at the commission that was at the uh, Corporation Commission, Carol Wolford. <coughs> and so uh, I selected her as the assistant director. Carol, uh, her husband got a job with Conco Phillips and they moved to, uh, to Bartlesville and she quit and I was looking for an assistant director. And there was a guy back in the abandoned mine land program. He wasn't head of it. He was the assistant back there. His name was Ben Pollard. And I'd, you know, been around for a little bit and watched Ben, and he had just excellent management capabilities. He understood things, and uh, uh, I asked him if he wanted to serve as the, uh, as the assistant director, and he accepted. <coughs> we were at a, a S SWCS meeting in Kentucky and he and Laura was at the bar we were having a cold beer and and, uh, and he said does it get any better and I said what do you mean he said well, I mean it's just during the day I might deal with five or six different topics and I said no it, it's just part of you know, your step up into that type of leadership and so he just retired from the commission just a couple of years ago and served a long time uh, as the assistant director. When I left, when I uh, decided my time was I'd done what I wanted to get done and was looking for new things to do, uh, we were on a trip out uh, to western Oklahoma together and I said, Ben, I'm going to leave and go to another job. And I said, do you want to be commissioner or executive director? And he studied it about it a while and said no. He had his smaller children at that time. That was in 1997. But uh, I, I have to tell one story. Uh, uh, when Clinton became president and uh, I was out in western Oklahoma, I think I was driving out west of Elk City to a conservation meeting and I get a call, it, we had a bag phone then, a mobile phone. I get a call and it was Congressman English's office and asked me if I wanted to be considered as the chief of the Soil Conservation Service. And uh, that would have been in 93 maybe, yeah, the spring of 93, and I, uh, you know, s thought about it and studied and prayed about it, because it, I'd be leaving the commission going to Washington, D.C., and uh, um, I decided not to do it, and it was a good decision because my dad passed away in September of that year, and I had to go through a lot of closing down of selling the dairy cows out and shifting uh, how, how we did business on the farm and stuff. And nearly left, I mean, nearly left the commission at that time to go back to the farm to milk cows. But I've, that 
old German from down at Granite in Greer County, Leonard Grauman, he said, Mason, take your time, take your time. And uh, I figured that uh, uh, milking cows, I'd seen bright lights and uh, not only that, but you know, I wasn't done at the commission. And it, was, it was a good, good thing that I didn't go back to the farm. It sounds like you went all over the state, though. I mean, you've seen every oh. every acre in the state practically. Oh, I, uh, yeah, uh, the whole whole state uh, understood it. Uh, my next job after the uh, after the commission was going to work for Oklahoma Farmers Union is uh, old state insurance and agriculture general agriculture organization. I was their lobbyist uh, for. Uh, nearly 10 years. Uh, so uh, that even helped me more to learn, you know, about rural issues, uh, uh, priorities and, and, and things, and coordinate things at the state capitol or watch bills or making sure a bad bill was killed or a good bill was moved along the process. So. <coughs> Uh, and, never, well, and never decided to run yourself for legislative Oh yeah, I did. I did. I, uh, uh, Congressman Watkins, Wes Watkins, uh, uh, retired, and I, I, uh, I talked to several people about running for Congress, but uh, decided not to. You know, it was that lingering thought of losing again. You know, yes. and so I couldn't commit uh, to do it doing that. Um, but no, it's, it, you know, I've had a wonderful life. It's uh, helping people and working with people. Uh, Hal Clark was uh, on one of the commissioners from Northwest Oklahoma and uh, he, uh, uh, when he was on the commission, they'd been on the commission several years, and he was on the commission, I believe chairman of the board, when they hired me as the director of the commission. <clears throat> and then um, uh, in 2002, uh, the chairman of this little royalty company uh, passed away, Vernon McNally, which was a conservationist from up in Woods County at Winoka. Uh, and he had uh, told the board and told the president of the, at that time that it, you know uh, when his seat was open, he wanted me to take his place on the. Uh, uh, at that time, it was uh, it was a farmers royalty, uh, farmers union cooperative royalty company, and uh, I served on the board uh, from 2002 uh, to 2007. And um, uh, the president at that time uh, would move from, to a different president. And uh, he was struggling as president. Uh, and he submitted his retirement in the spring of 2007. I, uh, he submitted his resignation letter and left and they said, Mason, you want to be president? And I said, well, sure. I've been at this job 10 years, so why not? Might as well change again. And so I spent nearly 10 years as president of Farmers Royalty. We, uh, we had, uh, we owned uh, about 104,000 acres of minerals in 14 states. And having the, Having the understanding of all of Oklahoma, about 86,000 acres was in Oklahoma. That really helped me, but I didn't know the geologist, the ge geology. Uh, how Clark was the chairman of the board and when he hired, when they hired me there, too. So Hal's been an important part of my life uh, through just a door opens and you walk through it. been good and that gave me a whole different understanding instead of knowing the first 
<clears throat> 12 inches of the state of Oklahoma and now I started understanding the geology down to 30,000 feet out by Cornell at the base of the uh, of the granite wash uh, out there. And fracking. And fracking and uh, drilling horizontal wells. Horizontal wells had started in about 2005 or so and boy just started picking up speed and and we had minerals right in the swath of where we were and so uh, uh, down in the Arcoma Basin, the Colgate, Hughes County, Pittsburgh County, a uh, little of Toka County and they started drilling those horizontal wells and getting great production and uh, We'd lease part of it, or we'd participate in uh, in drilling the well, drilling in completion, <clears throat> and uh, then all at once, uh, Arkansas started the Fayetteville Shale over there, another shale, that was the Woodford Shale in the Arcoma Basin, and uh, over in Arkansas, the Fayetteville Shale, and we had bought a mineral package back in the '90s that added a lot of minerals to the uh, to the shareholder. This is a shareholder company in 1928 to 1934. It's a classic Phil Kinkle up at OSU. Would, uh, I've talked to his class several times, co-op class. It's a classic closed co-op. There's a beginning and the end to it. So you would trade 40 acres of minerals for a share of stock in the co company par value of $50. <clears throat> and in 1934, there was problems there with who was checking out title and stuff. And of course, it was at the depth of the depression and dust bowl. And, uh, uh, but it ended at that time and the company just kept growing and being conservative with their money. And, we had picked up some mineral packages that added to it, and part of the Arkansas was was part of those mineral packages. So we started participating over there. We had uh, this guy that uh, uh, Doug Peace. He had been president of a similar company that had formed just like a Farmers Union Cooperative Royalty Company called Panhandle. And he had been president there, and they had a mandatory 70 retirement age, and so he had retired. And we picked him right up. Hal Clark said, we need to hire Dub as a consultant. And then he came on the board later on, and he was a great mentor to understand. We would talk three or four hours a week about different parts of Oklahoma or the Permian Basin down in Texas or North Dakota, the Williston Basin up there and because we had minerals and to get a better understanding of whether we needed to spend a hundred thousand dollars on participating in a well. Um, I looked at some of those early wells down in the Arcoma Basin uh, in Cole County that we had participated with and there was one section there that we would probably spent oh, $150,000 of participation uh, in maybe more than that because uh, they had multiple wells and when I left there that one section had produced for us uh, about two and a half million dollars worth of uh, uh, mainly natural gas down there. But uh, it was, and then, and then the technology going back to, uh, to GIS and the technology and use of going down uh, eight, ten thousand feet and then turning that drill bit and going out uh, a section and then ended up two sections, ten thousand feet out horizontally, uh, and then the completion technology and what they use in the completion technology. You probably don't know it, but there's a, there's a sand that, uh, that is prevalent that was used, it, it was silica sand that was used mainly in glass production. 
in Murray County, Southern Pot County, kind of right along the Arbuckles there. It's a white sand. It looks like sugar. <laughs> it's a wind-blown sand and it's irregular. It's pretty hard, hard particles. And uh, so some of this frac sand that they're using now, they're using two million pounds of frac sand on some of these wells to uh, do the completions on them. And it's coming from there. And there's other sands up in Minnesota that's a hard, it has to be a hard sand. And regular, the, the rounder it is, the better, because two round, uh, just butts up to one point when it's thrown, pushed into the formation and holds it open. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then water, understanding water, uh, and uh, what it takes. You want good clean water to do those frac jobs with, and so they'll use pond water, but uh, they have to treat it because it it ha has to be as high quality as drinking water. Uh, go down because you don't want to uh, include any type of bacteria because bacteria and carbon can react together and uh, form different types of gases that you don't want down in there. So it's a whole learning experience for me. Uh, and then you also had to worry about the conservation issues too around these wells. Well, sure. Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, while I was at the commission, we had a lot of problems with uh, <clears throat> some of these seismic crews in eastern Oklahoma going straight up and down hills. And if you go up a hill and take out all the trees and you get a big rainfall, then you got gullies coming down and all that sediment coming down, so we had uh, Representative Mike Mass that had been a uh, district employee. Uh, he introduced a bill and uh, we had a lot of negotiation on that, but uh, uh, we put some uh, stringent requirements on se seismic that they had to do different conservation <coughs> practices on it. How we doing? We're about done. Do you want to talk about ethanol, Penny? Is that happy? We can. Did you know Pearly Reed? Well, not enough to talk about it. Yeah, let's let's talk about ethanol. That was during my farmers' union time, maybe. Um, Peach Eater Creek. Make sure we get through Water Resources Board, the Water Pioneer, you know, um, Animal Waste Task Force. Let's talk, uh, let's continue on that and then we'll go a little on Farmers Union and Ethanol. Really, Ethanol goes under Farmers Union <coughs> a little bit. Mason, I think the Animal Waste Task Force yes. would be a big uh -huh. thing because that's where the state cost share program actually came out of. That we yeah. It's now been around for 20 years. Part of uh, 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 part of that non-point, uh, uh, the Clean Water Act that we talked about earlier, uh, we found that in eastern Oklahoma, uh, poultry farms were using the uh, uh, the litter from their poultry houses to increase the amount of hay and amount of cattle they could graze on track land because of the, uh, of the nitrogen and phosphorus in that poultry litter. The problem was, is they were putting it on the same track every year. And you could, you could take off nitrogen real easy by cutting the hay off of it. Phosphorus is slower because the plant doesn't require as much phosphorus, but they were putting on a lot of phosphorus through the poultry litter. And then when you'd get a rain, then what nitrogen was left or that phosphorus would get into the stream system and algae loves it. I mean, you're feeding algae uh, to grow. Um, and then algae caused uh, fish kills and other things in streams and 
the color and the smell, the stagnant water uh, that comes into play. <clears throat> well, it elevated in about 1995 uh, to uh, uh, larger poultry farms. Um, Tulsa's water supply was getting uh, affected by the algae and the smells and things like that. Sometimes rightfully so and sometimes not because of natural, natural uh, biology in the lakes. But also, the, uh, uh, Tyson was increasing and others were increasing their uh, uh, confined hog operations where they were uh, and sow farms and growing out pigs and, and they found the efficiency of doing that. <clears throat> and then in the Panhandle Seaboard came in and, and uh, uh, ramping it up big time out there. So uh, Governor Keating uh, appointed uh, a committee for the Animal Waste Task Force and that was really the real strong beginning of the cost share program through conservation districts. <clears throat> Not without a lot of heartburn and a, a strong words from us. Uh, we, we wanted the cost share program. We saw that it would benefit local landowners, solve problems, and we could show in water quality that it made made a difference. Uh, there was one guy from the wildlife department, his name was Ron Suttles, and he didn't like it at all. He just didn't want it. And so I had to go talk to the head of the wildlife department and, and ask him to put Ron off of there. He stayed on there, but he was less vocal about uh, not having a cost share program. But it uh, there was state and federal money that was put in, in there for those and did a, just a lot of a lot of good things and improved water quality in, in different areas. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to the job after the commission to the Oklahoma Farmers Union, now American Farmers and Ranchers. I went there not just to lobby, lobby in the state capitol is usually from February to the last Friday in May is the legislative session. It takes nearly all your time for that to get up on bills and make sure, because you don't just lobby for agriculture and conservation, it's rural development and it's oil and gas issues that affect mineral owners and landowners out there. Uh, but during my time off, and during the summer, then I'd find other things to do, and Farmers Union was created for cooperative development, where farmers would come together to sell their, their produce uh, together instead of getting hit by just one buyer out there, getting them what they wanted. So I took that and looked at different uh, uh, value-added ventures uh, that could come about in Oklahoma. We tried a uh, cow and bull uh, harvesting facility and, and raised good money, but just couldn't put $23 million together to, to build it in southeast Oklahoma. The, the next one we got federal uh, grant money for was ethanol. Um, uh, about that time uh, in 94, 2000, 2004, 2003 <clears throat> was uh, a time where we saw ethanol as uh, an additive to gasoline and would be was a renewable resource because you were raising grain to make the ethanol. <clears throat> we didn't raise at that time a lot of corn in Oklahoma. Uh, it was ethanol, big ethanol plants were up in the Corn Belt. So we looked at 
every other thing we could do. And one of the things uh, uh, young lady Morton, Hing, Morton Hing, Hingwick, her, her brother was a district conservationist, was a researcher for USDA up in Stillwater. And she said, well, let's go to the, the World Seed Lab and see if we can't find a barley that, uh, barley when it's harvested has, has a husk on it. Well, a husk reduces the amount of uh, alcohol that efficiency in making alcohol. You want something that husk out like corn does. You've got the seed kernel. And she looked all over the world to find different varieties of a hullless barley. And we started planting it, but then ethanol got, we, we couldn't put the money together for an ethanol plant. And so that research and development quit. Another one was uh, oil seeds. We just tried to look at different value added ventures that would help uh, farmers and diversify rather than weed on weed on weed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we uh, looked at canola and canola was starting to be developed down in at Kansas State and then OSU that was, uh, it was big up in North Dakota and up in that northern area, but it wasn't down, there wasn't good varieties down in the south. Uh, we even looked at okra. Okra is, uh, the seed of okra is uh, as high of, uh, it's higher oil content than even soybeans. Mm -hmm. But canola is what we stayed on and in the spring you'll see the big fields of uh, yellow and canola, uh, the plant that was going to process it down here <coughs> south of Oklahoma City downtown is closed now, but uh, there'll be there'll be uh, commercial use of canola. Plus, it's a heart healthy oil too. Mm. It smells bad when the whole field's blooming. Though. Oh, it does. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but those, those kind of things added value ventures that uh, we we had uh, that first uh, beef processing. We had a lady that helped us write the grant. The next grant through USDA on ethanol, we wrote it and uh, or with her help. And then the one on uh, oil seed processing, we wrote and we were the second best grant in the nation that year and, and through the USDA program. I, I was real proud, but it was a team effort of a lot of people, and we had a real strong local following. We looked at everything, you know, anything that would produce oil, uh, from sunflowers to okra. <laughs> Seems like a lot of what you've done has been team oriented. It is. Very, very it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had an excellent team at the Conservation Commission. Uh, I had a good team at the farm. Uh, uh, had a good team of uh, local ranchers, with <coughs> farmers union, <coughs> AFR, and then uh, in the royalty company, the board of directors was just great to it because we had a good diversity on there and, and knowledge about the industry. And uh, it was, you know, my life has been blessed. Sounds like it. Yeah. Anything else, Ben? Anything else? I think, I think we've done well. Oh, let's talk briefly about uh, AFR Farmers Union. Okay. I'm on their state board now, and that's a whole different um, part. But I, while I was lobbying, one of the things that was very important, you'd hear from senators that say, well, Farm Bureau want, takes this. Farmers Union wants this. Why don't y'all get together as agriculture? And so we started meeting together just Monday afternoon, the start of the legislative week, uh, uh, sitting down with all the ag groups. We 
chickens, uh, hogs, cattle, you know, all of their government relations or executive directors, we'd sit there and go through all the bills and say, here's our position, or, you know, uh, Farm Bureau wanted to take the lead on one program that was a high priority and, and was a low priority with me, then they would take that and then I'd take another bill, but we'd coordinate that every Monday afternoon. We'd sit down around the table and, and have a senator or legislator in to talk to us about a particular issue, and then we'd dismiss them. We'd discuss one of the things that uh, OSU, there was some that wanted to change the uh, OSU Board of Regents. And so we believe very strongly that we wanted to have a strong ag presence on that board. And so we shut that <coughs> that uh, project down. That was going to be an amendment to a bill. And uh, just, you know, just different things like that. that we changed the uh, the law that appointed the Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, because we had a commissioner that <coughs> seemed like he didn't want to leave there, so we had to force him out by changing the law. Is that right, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, and that was, you know, let's go back to that coordination. And, so overall, have you spent most of your time behind the wheel or behind the, the desk reading and preparing papers? Uh, or a little bit no, I had been Pollard that uh, prepared the papers. Yeah. I, I went out and glad had yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where I found that uh, the, the office was at the royalty company uh, okay. because we had a small staff. There was only four, three when I got there and then four when I left, well, more than that when I left, it was five, I guess, there. So it used, uh, and of course the technology and, and comfortable with the computer and we had a good system over there and to track our leasing and track our uh, participation in wells and if minerals came up for sale, then evaluate them whether we wanted to bid on them or not and buy them. So I found, because I didn't have an assistant, I didn't have a secretary, we all did our part to make the company. The best year <clears throat> was 2014, the company made $25 million. Uh, and uh, we would pay those original stockholders, they got, uh, uh, all the time I was there, $4,000 per year. Uh, on their investment of, uh, of that, they or their family, or if it was sold to somebody else. Uh, have so, you, have you retired from there? I've retired from there. I, I think I I either signed or stamped my name on eighty nine million dollars of uh, of uh, dividends to those uh, to those uh, uh, to our shareholders, a thousand shareholders. Let's say you did a very good job. Wouldn't you? <laughs> well, there was a lot of luck involved, <laughs> and well, uh, a lot of valuations and things like that. But, uh, it's not just luck, though. You've got to. Well, you've got to yeah, wait, wait every yeah, day right. to make wait, uh -huh. wise decisions. Yeah. But. Uh, and I guess it doesn't always pan out that. Well. No, it doesn't. But if you do your valuations, uh, uh, I think. Uh, while I was there, we uh, we probably had 97 percent of our wells that made wells, uh, three percent that were dry holes. So that's not bad. Of course, the advent of horizontal drilling, uh, but we did have some people that screwed up their drilling and drilling the. It's the technology is just amazing for drilling 5,000 feet, mm -hmm. going down and then drilling 5,000 feet horizontally, and then keeping that where you can put production casing down. The, it's better um, for the topsoil, though, I guess. Uh, it's better for the topsoil that. Yeah, you don't have as many. Yeah, and you don't have as many uh, 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 production. 
places. Now I have a picture on my phone uh, down by Colgate where they have three well bores that's not 10 feet apart. They drilled three horizontal, about seven to 8,000 feet horizontal uh, wells off of one pad. And there's more in other areas off of one pad. They just go down and then once they start to return, then they go out into the formation. Mm -hmm. But uh, just, uh, you know, technology and being open for change and technology and that little company, we could change our position real fast. Uh, like the Fayetteville uh, gas, natural gas price went down and all at once uh, uh, Western Oklahoma started producing from the granite wars horse on the wells and we were getting two dollars an MCF over in uh, in Arkansas and the Narcoma Basin and out there because of having oil with that natural gas coming out is higher BTU we were we noticed that those checks were five dollars an MCF and so what do you think we did we reduced our position gradually in Arkansas and increased it in western Oklahoma uh, for that. When I left, then the Scoop and the Stack plays had just, well, Scoop had already turned on and the Stack was going to, and there was a well that we had participated with in the Woodford formation, but then they found the upper formation Merrimack is better, and they uh, they drilled that well and completed it last uh, last fall, and uh, uh, it's a thirteen million dollar well, and it paid off in four months. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, uh, that's if you owned all the minerals. That you know, and you didn't have to pay anybody else uh, a royalty on them. Of course. Continental that drilled it has to pay royalty uh, on it, but that's drilling complete if you own the minerals uh, paid off in four months. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, it, it is. is. Amazing. It is. Uh, little companies doing well even with the lower prices and stuff. Well, we've covered a lot. Anything else you want to say before we close? Other than that, I just uh, appreciate your being able to do this and taking the time I've seen as I've said earlier your stuff that you've done just in the paper nothing nothing of the video or the or writing that, that was in the paper about Mr. Harper and, and some other people that you had interviewed and, and it intrigued me uh, to do that at the Farmers Royalty we did a book um, uh, and we had all the minutes from 1928 to present. And Paul Lambert uh, went through those minutes and wrote a history of the, of the company. We'll, we'll get you a copy uh, of it because it's a, a real piece of Oklahoma history dealing with mineral ownership. Well, in this project, we get to hear the voices, right? Yeah. That, that's the big part of this, too. Yeah. And, well, it's been fun. Thank you very much. Today is March the 9th, 2018, and I'm Tanya Fincham, and I'm here in Oklahoma City with Mason Mungle and Ben Pollard. And this is for part two of our interview with Mason. And today we're going to focus on his time during 1986 to 97 ish mm -hmm. as an executive director of the Oklahoma Conservation Commission. So let's get going. We're good. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd go back just a little bit. Uh, I was on the Conservation District Board in Natoka, and to be a commissioner on the commission, you have to be on the Conservation District Board in that particular five areas of the state, the Northeast, the Southeast, Southwest, Northwest, and then Central part of the, the state. So uh, uh, I was had been on the board at a Toka County Conservation District and uh, uh, I was uh, was 
told that there may be a board seat, uh, a commission seat open, and uh, and so I was selected uh, as the commissioner by Governor Nye uh, in the spring of 1985 <coughs> to go on the commission, and so. Uh, I served on the commission from 1985 to uh, just a short period of time till January of uh, 1986 uh, of when I was hired as the uh, director of the executive director of the commission. Okay. But uh, it's, it's what's uh, interesting, I, I can't help to go back several times and say you had to be a conservation district director in order to be the commission and you have to go, the governor makes the nomination and then you have to go before Senate confirmation. So each of the the commissioners had to go through that process uh, uh, with their particular state senator that, that they're a constituent of. Mine was Roy Boatner um, uh, from Durant. And uh, it was uh, uh, it, it was very enlightening to be able to go on the commission first and have even though a short period of time to get to know the other commissioners from the state and uh, and then being able to step in as the executive director but uh, we had some really great commissioners uh, for me to come in uh, following a uh, uh, Leonard Solomon and they called him King Solomon uh, and he, he he had been uh, the executive director for a number of years so um, it, it you know it was uh, it, it was interesting you you've interviewed Hal Clark and Hal has uh, has always been a great friend uh, how lives in Guyman, but his ranch is uh, in uh, uh, about uh, about ten miles south of the uh, Colorado line, and about uh, about twenty miles or so to the New Mexico line to the west, and then to the south, uh, probably about twenty miles or so to Texas. So he's right up in the corner of the state. One of the things that that was important to me is to uh, to go to each commissioner's place of business or the, their ranch and uh, and see how they did business uh, and see what they were looking at when I talked to them on a particular issue on the phone. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to feel like I sat with them uh, right there. Uh, Hal Clark uh, and then Leonard Grauman was from southwest Oklahoma, from Granite, Oklahoma. Uh, an old German family that had settled uh, there probably after statehood and there was quite a few uh, uh, Grauman's in that area uh, uh, just south of, of uh, Granite and then east of uh, Mangum in Greer County. So he had been on the uh, district board in Greer County, and you have to stay on the, on the district board in order to uh, uh, to be eligible to serve. Uh, Leonard was a cotton and wheat farmer uh, and ran cattle down uh, uh, just south of Granite in some really really good good uh, farming country right in that area uh, with irrigation and. Uh, uh, cotton was a major, uh, I learned a lot about cotton uh, uh, with Leonard uh, Grauman. <clears throat> Leonard and his board was uh, quite an uh, eclectic group of, uh, of guys uh, down there. I went, the first time I went down there was in the spring of, um, of uh, uh, 86, spring or maybe it was early summer and um, Governor Bellman was campaigning and, and uh, I'd stayed I'd stayed with uh, I think Leonard Grauman overnight and uh, uh, we toured the area and 
it was always uh, uh, quite, you didn't know quite what to expect with them. I noticed that they, uh, they put me in the center so they could, uh, when we were driving in the pickup out, uh, out around Greer County, but they gave me a really good look at what Greer County was about and where some of the uh, board members places were mm. because I was always interested in agriculture and conservation uh, and I wanted to learn as much as I could about the whole state. Uh, Bill Joe Culver was the central district commissioner. Bill Joe ranched uh, north of Pahuska and uh, uh, had a very large operation. Uh, Really, he ended up, uh, his place backed up to now the uh, 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 tall grass prairie up there. <clears throat> and that was quite a uh, traumatic experience for those ranchers up there when they were going to bring the buffalo in and they were close to it because uh, uh, during that time there was a lot of buffalo in the nation that had Bain's disease and you just don't want that in a cow herd. I mean, you, you have to uh, eliminate your cow herd uh, if, if you get bangs in them. So that was a, um, uh, 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 quite an experience, especially with uh, Bill Joe and his wife of going up there and sitting at their house. And uh, it was a beautiful place. It, it uh, backed up to uh, you know, where uh, a, a kind of a hill went up abruptly uh, and he looked back to the east uh, uh, from his house and his cattle pens. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he did a lot of trading of cattle uh, back there in the uh, early, uh, late 80s and early 90s and um, uh, one time we uh, we went to uh, on a conservation tour of the Pluse area of uh, of Washington and Idaho and uh, Oregon, kind of in that south corner where the, they really farmed the hills for erosion because they far farmed them on a what a forty percent slope or something like that. But he he. And everybody introduced themselves and, and said, well, why are you here? And he said, well, I don't know. I just came with Mason. But <laughs> he was he was that way, pretty plain spoken uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the way that uh, he did business. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the gentleman that took my place on the commission was Doc Coker from Southeast Oklahoma. And... Um, uh, Ben, uh, uh, ben and I talk about Doc, and we went down to his funeral, and and he was uh, he was nearly a hundred when he passed away, but um, he uh, smoked a lot, and uh, and of course during that time from eighty six to ninety seven, non smoking came into the state office buildings, but he. He, he finally started having to go out and, and smoke instead of smoke during the uh, commission meeting. But uh, uh, Doc was uh, 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 an educator. Uh, he had taught school in little country schools uh, down in southeast Oklahoma. His wife uh, worked for Congressman uh, Wes Watkins and so very, uh, uh, very well connected. Uh, he ranched, um, I don't know how many thousand acres of, uh, of that rough uh, uh, country down there, just ran cows, didn't farm any. But he told me, he, he called me Mace, he said, Mace, if you come down here, you got to bring your rod and reel and your gun. You, you always have those in the back of your car. Uh, and here I'm a state. The, you know, agency director, but we we did a lot of talking and we uh, brushy. He had a one site on Brushy Peaceful, and he was a watershed uh, person. He really believed in the watershed uh, program, 
and uh, and then in his area down there, the abandoned mine land program was uh, was was uh, uh, filling up uh, the uh, uh, the pits uh, where they surface mined uh, and then also there was underground mines that had been discontinued you know years ago and they started caving in so uh, uh, one of the things that he would say at the commission he'd say Mace I want to see dirt flying down there at that project <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, we didn't we didn't uh, have any upstream flood controls that was built. I think the one on his place was built uh, uh, just about the time that I came in. Uh, each one of those watersheds had their own watershed plan and the Soil Conservation Service in RCS had, had uh, determined where those sites were going to be. Sometimes they would move a little bit but most of the time it was part of the whole watershed plan. So it wasn't Doc Coker getting a upstream flood control on his place. It had been planned for years on the Brush Peaceful uh, uh, watershed. Uh, that watershed even backs up to the ammunition depot um, by Kiowa or uh, Savannah. And uh, uh, it uh, uh, it's, it's a long watershed and then it wraps back around the Hartshorn and that's where a lot of the flooding and, and then ran into Eufaula Lake. But <clears throat> but those, uh, 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 he was just a firm believer in uh, seeing dirt flying and he was, uh, 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 had a lot of good stories uh, to tell and uh, his wife was just a great person and I'd go down and stay all night with him, hunt or fish, and we would talk about about conservation and and different things, what we could do to to plan for uh, 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 for the future. Because uh, when he was in his eighties, he planted. Uh, uh, no, he didn't plant. He uh, uh, dug up uh, native uh, uh, pecan trees and grafted them. And, uh, you know, they were bearing when he died, uh, maybe in his late 70s. But, but anyway, you know, he was always looking to the, to the future, as most of the commissioners uh, were, uh, were that away. Uh, let's see, the north, west, northeast area was... Uh, Bill Joe, and then the central was Scott King, and then... Oh, yeah, Bill and Joe was Ed north. Johnson I'm sorry, Jack, Jack uh, Bill Hunter. Joe Culver was northeast, mm -hmm. uh, not central. Scott King from uh, Carter County Arbuckle Conservation District was the central uh, district uh, commissioner, and Scott uh, uh, was. I, I didn't get to spend as much time with him um, uh, on the commission, but uh, uh, they would. They would post their district m meeting. You had to post it in a public place. Mm -hmm. They posted it, and uh, and it had to be what forty eight hours. Well, they posted it, but it was usually at Scott's house that overlooked a lake, and they would cook hamburgers. And I'll say this on camera: but cocktails. Uh, we'd have cocktails before the district meeting. But um, uh, you, um, when you sit down to their meeting, it was all business, and you better be prepared because all of all the people that are on that board were businessmen and very successful. Uh, most of them were millionaires. Uh, um, the the one commissioner that. Uh, or uh, district board member, I, I can't recall his Gene name. Gene Neustadt. Gene Neustadt, um, uh, just uh, was, I'd go down and run ideas by him, go to his office uh, there in Ardmore, and it was the Neustadt building, and, and then you had Neustadt Lake that was a water supply, that was upstream flood control, the water supply for the, uh, um, uh, uh, for, Ardmore in the surrounding area, but um, 
Scott Keene was uh, uh, a great uh, uh, commissioner. He uh, uh, he didn't take part as many activities as Leonard Grauman did on the national uh, front. Leonard was on the uh, Great Plains uh, Cost Year Program Committee, and uh, uh, for a, a long time, one of one of the things that uh, that I hated being there uh, during David Walters uh, uh, time as governor uh, <clears throat> he replaced Leonard Grauman with James Eddie Phillips and uh, and that really hurt Leonard uh, he passed away he had a heart attack or stroke I think and then a heart attack and passed away just a few years after but it just it weighed on me personally because he was a personal friend. Uh, when I'd have some new idea that I wanted to do, <clears throat> like uh, the director of leadership or uh, things like that, I would uh, talk to him about it and then he'd call me uh, after he'd been on the tractor or <laughs> the drive back home and tell me what he liked and didn't like about something. But uh, he he wouldn't make quick decisions, but he would think about those decisions. And he was an old German that that was uh, was a good thinker and was pretty tough uh, too. So their terms weren't weren't for life. It was just term limits, no. like every four five, years. Five four, term. Uh, Five, five, every five, five years. years, so you had one commissioner every year that would uh, uh, be replaced. And you could choose whether you wanted to stay on or not? Or uh, Yeah, uh, uh, the, I, I thought that Leonard was in good shape with Governor Walters and his state senator down there, but his senator had grown weak and had not uh, talked to Walters about mm -hmm. making sure that he was replaced. Um, but the governor does make the appointment so every five, one commissioner each year. It's the governor's yeah. choice. So he has the final say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, you just want to make sure that you know the governor and and uh, uh, usually it's the governor's staff, but he's the final uh, final say uh, in any choice. Uh, Bill Joe Culver was replaced by Sondra Drummond, which was the first uh, female uh, commissioner, and uh, Sondra was a great commissioner. She had lost her husband uh, several years before, and so she was running her ranching operation uh, uh, up by uh, Hominy. Uh, she has one of those old uh, Osage uh, Indian two-story houses and just uh, has redone it and uh, it has the backwards swastika on the entrance of it that was there and she kept keeps it up but uh, I went up there with her and and went out and they were trying to get bulls out of the pasture and and uh, uh, her hired hand uh, had to go down in there and I got on his horse and that bull came running out of that that draw <clears throat> that you couldn't get the horse down the end to, but you could on foot. And, and that horse knew exactly what to do, got right behind that bull, and we took him, took him in to the, to the, uh, to the lot. But, uh, you know, you just make sure that you're stepping with those commissioners uh, uh, because they're, they're the boss. Uh, they're the ones that hire and fire the director, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I, I, it, it, it taught me a lot to uh, to understand um, how to first be honest uh, with the, the commissioners in your duties as as a state uh, employee. Uh, but also to look to the future, as most of them did. Uh, and Sondra Drummond was, uh, you know, it was just neat to have the first uh, uh, female uh, on the commission. Uh, Virginia Kidd, late, and later on, uh, when Doc Coker, another change of governor, I think under 
Keating, Keating mm -hmm. uh, was uh, uh, was appointed to take Doc's place um, on the commission, and she was uh, a different type of. Uh, 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 didn't really uh, ranch or farm that much, but uh, knew uh, LaFleur County uh, like the back of her hand. And uh, her husband was, I think, a banker down there, and they had the, the kid uh, uh, center there where we had a lot of functions over the years. Well, when you came in, you were the newest, you were the only new one? Only at the same time, it yeah. wouldn't be more than one new one. Yeah, one in '85, uh, uh, the rest of the commissioners had been on uh, several years, mm -hmm. so they were. So, but they all knew me. I, I knew them, and uh, they had known my granddad, uh, Paul Mungle, that had served on the commission till the '60s, and so they knew of. Uh, you know that the thinking process and the commitment to uh, uh, soil and water conservation. But your character and your approach was a little different from Solomon's. Uh, yes, uh, so? uh, 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 very much uh, so. But you had to kind of uh, you had to go with the things that he had set up. Uh, uh, you know and the kingdom that he had set up and the and he he was a great one to know the whole state. He had been before in years past he had been involved with 4-H uh, down in uh, Jackson County at Altus and so <clears throat> he he brought a lot of that good knowledge uh, with him but he, he was um, I think fairly controlling over things, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but he was all, always open to uh, ideas that would uh, further the conservation program, and um, uh, it, it, it was uh, I had to find my own way. The mm -hmm. first year. Uh, I had one employee that kept saying, "Mason, you need to watch. You know, people are." are going to try to, uh, you know, force you out or uh, or uh, change the way the things are done. And after that first year at the commission, I thought, you know, we're not going to go any place if I keep looking over my shoulder. Uh, and I knew that the commissioners were ready for uh, to expand programs. Uh, we had the abandoned mine land program, and it was pretty well set. Um, that was uh, a uh, uh, a coal uh, tax that on any coal that was mined would come to the states uh, that had coal mining uh, and abandoned mines, and we have a lot of abandoned mines in eastern Oklahoma. Uh, the the other one, uh, the, the, the uh, Clean Water Act. Uh, had uh, had been renewed in 1985, and so uh, uh, that program uh, had uh, had was in if in its infancy to do non-point source water quality along with the conservation and the locally led. We have to keep that in mind because the conservation district act that Oklahoma passed was was uh, here you had these fed employees that were sent out to these counties but they didn't have uh, uh, they uh, they didn't have the ability to go out to a farmer and start working with him because of what people thought of a federal employee so that's the reason for the conservation district act is to have that local unit of government there that uh, with uh, uh, three elected uh, board members and two appointed by the commission. Mm -hmm. And so we always tried to balance uh, those appointments and in, uh, 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 in, in locally led is just, you know, so important and that's how uh, 
we tailored all the programs, the abandoned mine land program, the, the, uh, the water quality program, uh, the watershed program, all of those. Uh, the local sponsors were the conservation districts. Kind of the bridge. Kind yeah. Of, kind of the bridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mason, would you speak to how difficult it was or easy to follow a legend like Leonard Sullivan? <laughs> well, uh, 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 patience. Uh, I think that was uh, the the biggest thing is that uh, uh, here I was uh, on. I think in the earlier interview I said on Saturday I was milking cows and I milk cows because I wanted to milk that day. Uh, 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 and on Monday, I was sitting in the office in uh, the nearly new uh, agriculture building uh, in Oklahoma City. But um, uh, it was, uh, 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 he had started a lot of programs, but he was well known at the legislature, mm. very well known. And I came in there with uh, hardly any political savvy as far as the leg I, I understood it. I'd been in a ag leadership program. My dad was very uh, uh, politically oriented uh, in Atoka County and in the state. He knew a lot of the people and they knew him. So uh, it, it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, my first day on the job, the uh, Roland Reimer, the uh, chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, pulled me, told me to come over to his cap, uh, to his uh, office at three o'clock in the afternoon, and he said, uh, "Now, Lynn Solomon said that y'all were going to buy these fire trucks, and you've got appropriations for these three fire trucks, uh, uh, two in eastern Oklahoma and one in his district of western Oklahoma." And I said, well, I just got there and I just ha have to look at the budget and where the money is. And he said, the money's there because uh, it had been appropriated uh, apparently the year before. But, you know, I never could find where that money was. Uh, luckily, my senator, uh, Senator Boatner, was the chairman of the uh, appropriation subcommittee over in the House for our agency and I would go over there and spend time with him and and then he would you know help me out and I would spend time at the Capitol one one morning early one morning I <clears throat> went uh, uh, they had a coffee shop down in the basement and I uh, and all of the senators would would meet down there early in the morning and uh, Senator Stipe and Senator Ford and didn't make any difference what party it was. They'd just sit down there and told stories and mm -hmm. had coffee. And so I'd go down there and kind of sit, you know, not with them, but just sit where I could listen to them. And that morning, uh, uh, Governor Nye came in. This would have been the spring of uh, 1986. And Governor Nye came in and he said, Mason, come over here. I want to see you. And he said, uh, Mason, I know that there's a lot of movement to move forestry from the Department of Agriculture over to the Conservation Commission, and I don't want you to do anything to enhance that because I want it to stay with the Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would have liked to have forestry over there, and a lot of the staff would have thought that would have been a great addition to the conservation effort. <clears throat> but uh, when the governor said that, then uh, I told the staff, I said, don't, don't do anything else. You know, we're, it's going to stay in, uh, in the Department of Agriculture. And he said, uh, oh, by the way, I had a pretty yellow tie on, and I guess I didn't, wasn't watching. I dribbled coffee on that tie. And he, he said, well, you got coffee on me, your tie. Well, I then went to the office 
and get a call and said the governor wants you to come over to his office uh, you know later on that day so I drove back to Norman put on another shirt and tie and back up here and when I walked in his office he said Mason he changed ties <laughs> very you know very uh, very much on top of things uh, governor and I was and if you ever heard him speak I I learned I learned to speak from uh, Governor Nye and Wes Watkins, and two of the things is if you watch Governor Nye, he has like three or four points on his hand <laughs> that he speaks from, and uh, uh, and then Wes Watkins, uh, he would uh, he would say, Tanya, uh, this is what I'm talking about, or Mason. And you know when when they call your name, well, you sit up and and you know you're kind of proud to be there, and that's uh, a, a couple of things I use sometimes to wake somebody up from the meeting, but uh, uh, it uh, and it gave you that personal contact with with people, but. Uh, Leonard Grauman, the commissioner from Southwest Oklahoma, we were sitting at a meeting. This guy was talking and talking and talking. He leaned over to me and he said, Mason, that guy was done 15 minutes ago. And those kind of things, you, I always heard, you have five minutes of people's undivided attention. You better break it up with a story. And I had some good dairy stories. And then you've got three minutes to wind it up. And so uh, so three points is about all that you can get in uh, in that period of time. If you talk longer than that, then you lose uh, your audience and you lose their undivided attention. Nothing's on your hands today. <laughs> Let's see the hands. Yeah. No, uh, I've got it right here <laughs> on the on the sheet of paper. The, the, a couple of people I want to talk about that were district board members. Uh, uh, Dick Longmire was uh, one of them. I mentioned Gene Neustadt, but Dick was uh, on the district board down in Garvin County, and he. Uh, he would go in uh, to the office down there and open all the mail, whether it was district mail or federal mail. He, it didn't make any difference to him. He went in and opened, he knew when the mail came and he went in there and opened the mail. Dick Longmire was a personal friend of my granddad, so Dick knew granddad real well. And uh, uh, now you have Longmire Lake that's a water supply for, uh, that's upstream flood control on the Washita River. And uh, uh, it's a water supply for uh, Paul's Valley. Uh, uh, they have Paul's Valley Lake, but they needed a more consistent water supply and, and Longmire Lake is, is one of those. Uh, at Dick, uh, uh, was very well connected politically uh, when he went to Washington D.C. Well, I, one time we had dinner with some SCS guys at that time, soil conservation guys, and uh, I spoke up and he leaned over to me and said, Mason, you need to not say anything. We're going to be talking here. <laughs> and I I kept my mouth shut and listened uh, to what they had planned. I mean, they they always had a strategy that they were going to try to initiate uh, for conservation or upstream flood controls. Uh, but uh, those little things, you don't. I, I, you know, he was in his eighties, um, and when he passed away, he had a stroke and passed away. But uh, you know, I always um, uh, appreciated them being honest with you. You know, if they didn't like something, they'd sure tell you uh, about it. Uh, another gentleman from Duncan was Nolan Fuquay. Uh, Nolan Fuquay was one of the uh, helped organize the National Association of Conservation Districts and 
in turn the Oklahoma Association of Conservation District. He was also uh, one of the original founders, I guess, of the Boy Scouts uh, in, of America. Uh, he was an oil man, but also a great conservationist uh, with land uh, around Duncan there. And now you have Nolan Fuquay Lake, that's a municipal industrial water supply for uh, Duncan. Um, but all of those guys, they uh, uh, they knew what they wanted to get done, and uh, and they got it done. Uh, one one time <clears throat> during Bellman's uh, administration, this was after Nye, uh, <clears throat> Bellman was uh, had uh, this idea of consolidation of agencies, and uh, he was. Uh, uh, having these meetings around the state, and usually the uh, representative ch for that area chaired the meetings, and they had one down at Halliburton uh, uh, at uh, in Duncan. And Nolan called me and said, uh, Mason, you're going to come and testify how important that the conservation districts and that they're the ones that uh, the conservation district directors in the areas are the ones that really employ you, not the governor. And uh, and mm -hmm. I said, I said, no one. I'm a part of the executive branch, and I answer to the governor. And the governor is the ones that's initiating this consolidation plan. He said, no. Uh, you're going to come down and testify uh, about the Conservation uh, Commission and that the conservation districts are the ones that feed and are locally led and are elected and appointed by the commission and and you're going to tell them what to do and that was a stressful a speech that I had to give there but uh, it went all right and there wasn't any repercussions. Uh, through the executive branch. Didn't have to do any middle ground. I well, I, I probably plowed, plowed, plowed a little bit of middle <laughs> ground in, in there, but uh, you know, we uh, went down there and uh, he had a big old Cadillac and we had lunch and I mean, we uh, he drove fast out there to the, make sure we got there on time to the, to the meeting place. But, you know, all you know. You in the first part of the interview, you asked about governors, and and there was these little things that always were part of it. Just like after Bellman and Walters and replacing for some of the commissioners. But one of the things under, <clears throat> and we'll kind of move to a, a little different subject during during uh, uh, Walters' administration. Uh, <clears throat> the Department of Health had all Department of Health and environmental permitting in it for municipalities, uh, water, trash, and they had a uh, pollution, Oklahoma Pollution Control Board uh, that w was all of the agencies coordinating and so I sat as the uh, as the executive director of the commission, I had a seat on that board, and then Dick Longmire, as a uh, as a citizen, had a chair, and then there was different people. Uh, but uh, uh, the health department needed to be split up because you had public health in the same building as you did permitting for wastewater and, and trash and a lot of different things. And so uh, in, um, in 93, uh, uh, a bill was introduced to uh, split up the age, uh, really split up how agencies worked uh, and on mainly water, uh, water quality, environmental issues. And uh, Patty Eaton was uh, Walter's Secretary of the Environment. Gary Shear was the uh, 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 Secretary of Ag. And Gary and I had been friends for a long time. He was from Antlers. He was a state representative, and then he got picked by Walter's as a, a commissioner and Secretary of Ag. 
and um, we we want to protect our turf in in non-point uh, water quality and, and several other things and we wanted to have a conservation district board member on that DEQ board because of that interrelationship. And then we were in a fight. Uh, Patty Eaton was also the head of the water board uh, at that time. And, and so uh, uh, it, it, it was uh, quite a struggle to make sure that we got what we did. And, and uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, Kim Tweed was, was uh, uh, there in the office and I was doing something. She, she said, uh, Patty Eaton wants to talk to you. And I knew that we were close on negotiation. And so she and I got on the phone right out there in the front in the reception area. And, and we negotiated the language that would uh, still give us jurisdiction over uh, non-point source, uh, not uh, non-point source can be a lot of different things. It can be municipal runoff, or it can be agriculture runoff. Uh, we were the agency to go out and do the monitoring, and because our locally led conservation districts, we could direct. Uh, money uh, to solving those non-point source uh, issues with agriculture. Agriculture didn't have that, uh, that locally led, and uh, DEQ didn't and Water Board didn't, so it gave us a foot up and, and we uh, made sure that we, we, uh, uh, we were in, in, in where we had that jurisdiction negotiating. And one of the things we did get in the conservation district <coughs> director on the DEQ board in Vernon McNally uh, uh, from Winoka, uh, what is that, uh, Eastwoods? Eastwoods, Eastwoods Conservation, conservation mm -hmm. District uh, was, uh, had been uh, involved in a lot of uh, issues and uh, he got selected to uh, to uh, be one of those, I don't know whether they call them commissioners or board members uh, on that. There's a lot of names and faces. Yeah, it is. And personalities. It is. It is. And you have to, you have to know those players, you know, and every once in a while one sneaks up and, and uh, on you that uh, I didn't see the uh, James Eddie Phillips appointment coming. I should have known it, but I didn't. Uh, I was wishing and hoping instead of working and uh, working for his reappointment. Well, was it common common practice to name lakes after various people that dealing with? Uh, especially issues? these older ones like Nolan Fuqua and Jean Neustadt and 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 Longmire. The, uh, uh, especially these were all municipal industrial lakes, so those guys were very involved in their communities, not just as a district board member, but in their communities. Well, what was the process for getting that name back? So, I really couldn't tell you. Is it something the yeah. commission recommended or someone, or the district itself? or in The city of Duncan, Nolan yeah. Fuquay had been the mayor, okay. and so oh. he was, um, he had been in city politics for many, many years, so. I think they did it as respect for the work he had done to get the lake yeah. and, and his service to the community. Yeah, most of these, like I said, those watershed plans were fairly old, went back to the 40s, mm. the, especially on the uh, Washita uh, River. And um, um, all the drainage in Carter County, Garvin County, Murray County goes right into the Washita uh, River. So those that was one of the first watersheds that was uh, uh, that was planned uh, under the public law, the first uh, public law, five thirty four, five thirty four, and then later on public law five sixty six that uh, expanded those watersheds like the brushy peaceful and the boggy down in my country uh, muddy and clear boggy watersheds, uh, but. Um, uh, 
you know, probably we had some input. I don't remember any of the stories uh, about that. Particularly, it would have been uh, Longmire, but one of the board members uh, on the Garvin board was uh, bank president in uh, Paul's Valley, Jack Grimm, and, and he had a big sway. Uh, he he swung a pretty good size stick in, in the community and surrounding areas. So all of those kind of things, you know, come into play. But, you know, like the Environmental Quality Act, you had to you had to take advantage of those things and uh, you know you have to push a little bit further in what you uh, uh, what what you uh, maybe your jurisdiction is and we did and we were able to come out uh, we had friends in the legislature because that was by having those 89 conservation districts at that time uh, uh, we, you know, at least uh, two or three of those district board members knew every legislator in their districts and had coffee with them mm -hmm. and um, knew their congressmen on a first name basis. Politics. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it taught me a lot about politics and how you uh, move with the flow. We've talked quite a bit about uh, uh, upstream flood controls, and as I came in as the, uh, the executive director, <clears throat> uh, a lot of those sites were aging, and they hadn't been maintained very well. Uh, a, a couple of years before I got there, uh, the federal government, there was a, uh, a dam up in Idaho or Washington that failed and flooded a big area. And there was an initiative for dam safety uh, issues. And uh, um, uh, Solomon, he saw that, uh, Leonard Solomon, King Saul, he, he saw that as uh, as more regulatory, and we weren't regulatory. We didn't have any. Re we couldn't tell anybody what to do. We mm -hmm. we led them to the trough, and uh, if they drank, then they drank. But but uh, uh, dam safety was a regulatory issue. If there's one program that the commission should have had was uh, dam safety because of. S Soil Conservation Service building dams, uh, providing technical assistance for dams, and then the districts and the commission have jurisdiction over the uh, upstream flood control programs uh, too. So uh, 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 dam safety really came on really strong uh, the first years that uh, that I was at the commission plus. I believe it was about 1989 there was a hurricane that came from the Gulf and straight up uh, middle of Oklahoma in some cases dropped uh, 12 inches of rain in certain areas and so we had some uh, dams, some upstream flood control dams that blew out the emergency spillway. That led us to more in-depth look at at cost benefit ratio what what if those dams weren't there then how many county roads would have got flooded uh, how many cities would have been underwater uh, how many people could have lost their lives and upstream flood control came about in, during the Dust Bowl, when there was a great downpour in Texas, came down the Ouachita River and flooded Hammond, Oklahoma, and washed, I don't know how many lives that were lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, started the PL 534 program. So we, we did a lot more analysis there and told the legislature, look, you know, we've got all these upstream flood controls that districts are the sponsor of, and the SCS goes out and builds them uh, with us getting uh, the land rights uh, for the structures. And <clears throat> But we don't have any money to help the districts maintain them. And 
uh, that that rainfall event was a prime example of what happened. There was federal money coming, but it was with state match, and so we were able to start the upstream flood control uh, uh, part of the commission where we had uh, uh, beavers were a big problem. They would mound, uh, uh, make their homes around the, the principal spillway out there and would stop it up. And when you had it stopped up and you had a rainfall event, then mm -hmm. it wouldn't drain properly. <clears throat> so we had, first there was some siphons, uh, and really they didn't work very well, and then got into trees on, on these dams that weren't uh, cut, and, you know, there was just a lack of maintenance on them, but dam safety uh, kind of spurred that on, plus that rainfall event. So <clears throat> we were able, Dan Siebert was over that uh, the uh, technical uh, group, and this, what he did was uh, help uh, put people, I think Garvin County, they had a real good guy down there that knew how to do things out on dams, and then down at Chickasha, and I think those were the two main mm -hmm main areas where we set them up with equipment to uh, to drain those sites and it just expanded you know from there and and we kind of led the way and then that was that uh, also during that time uh, the watershed coalition came on and uh, uh, a lot of the states were probably the leader of number of sites uh, but a lot of states have those upstream flood control sites, and they were experiencing the, the same thing with dam safety. So it was, it it uh, it helped us do that evaluation, and then after I left, they went even further than that with the GIS and uh, would would link up with the. Uh, uh, National Weather Service. National Weather Service, but uh, if not if maps, but the those local rainfall gauges. Mesonet. That, Mesonet. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, Ms., we coordinated with all the districts, and they found Mesonet sites when that first was started because we saw the the, the benefit of rainfall plus uh, you know dry conditions uh, out there. So, uh, you know, all of those kind of things just kind of happened and, and uh, we were able to uh, 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 take part in those, in those uh, kind of areas. The, uh, uh, but getting that state money, designated state money to match federal money was really important. We could get local match money through, you know, the efforts of their districts of going out and checking in those sites to make make sure and making a log of what needed to be done. Well, with the beavers, did you have to get involved with wildlife department wildlife? <coughs> yeah, yeah, uh, USDA and USDA and U.S. Animal. Fish and Wildlife or USDA uh, US Animal Damage Control. Am animal mm -hmm. Damage Control mm -hmm. with USDA. I had a great idea to put a, a bounty on them, uh, a pelt bound, bound, bounty, and Dan Siebert said that won't work. And, you know, it just doesn't work that way. And we we brainstormed different ideas to uh, uh, try to uh, correct the problem. But the best thing was is to provide maintenance and get ahead of those little boogers uh, out there. Mm -hmm. Because they'd even tunnel into the dam and would cause problems uh, in the dam. Yeah, a lot of a lot of different little things like that. You'd have to check frequently because it could happen over. Oh yeah, or, or yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, the principal spillway um, is usually a pretty tall structure, so you can see them trying to build and stop up that hole <coughs> where it would drain down uh, that area. Uh, but that, uh, 
you know, kind of set a standard for a national program through the watershed uh, coalition that you have those local units out there that could go and respond real quick if districts had problems. That let's let's go back to that Environmental Quality Act of '93. One of the things that that <clears throat> not only the water quality, non-point water quality, we were the agency that had the best uh, grassroots program for any type of environmental quality education mm -hmm. in K through 12. And um, we talked a little bit earlier about Project Wild, which was already started when I got there, and that was a coordinated effort with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife. But also, we had some other uh, uh, program, uh, project, uh, it was Project WOW, and then uh, Learning Tree. A Project Learning Tree, which coordinated with the Department of uh, uh, Forestry. Mm -hmm. We got back in with, good with forestry, and they knew we weren't going to take them over, and so they started. But, uh, and then uh, um, Project uh, WET which was water quality uh, issues, and then later on was uh, Blue Thumb, which really originated up at Tulsa, more of urban, mm -hmm. getting people to uh, look where they pour their used oil or paint and knock down the storm drain because it runs right into some type of reservoir. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you'd be surprised where watersheds head out. Uh, this, uh, where the commission is and where the office is that we're doing this interview is in Deep Fork watershed and all this water goes into Lake Arcadia and mm -hmm. that's Edmund's drinking water supply. So, he, uh, you know. Uh, it's all connected, huh? It's all connected. It's, it's, but uh, 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 all of those programs, uh, uh, you know, we had some great people that uh, got teachers, new teachers, that were very interested in stimulating young people in other areas, and uh, and they the teachers were part of uh, the developing the curriculum for uh, those projects uh, out there. And there's a lot of people that have uh, emulated what we started there at the commission and we didn't look at boundaries or forestry you can't do this we just uh, wildlife you know they would want our support because even though they've got rangers out there those uh, wildlife rangers they're more of uh, you know catching people that are destroying the wildlife when ours were a coordinated effect and uh, a lot of good things come uh, came about. A project, uh, uh, the Blue Thumb, is uh, uh, that opened the eyes of a lot of urban people, and we have people that uh, go out and monitor uh, water that comes from urban areas and see if somebody's poured uh, oil in it or whatever it is, but. It's uh, uh, it, it, it's not the K through 12, it's more of volunteer, adult volunteers to do that because they have to go through some pretty, uh, if you take a water sample, it has to follow a good set standard before okay. it gets. Citizen scientist? Yes, citizen yes. scientist, exactly. Uh, uh, on, on those, but it was it was all of those things that had been kind of formulated as I stepped in to the director ship that I knew how important those kind of things were not only to our staff but to the possibility of getting out in um, the public schools and providing that extra uh, education for uh, for different type of uh, uh, environmental concerns or environmental things to understand 
later on, I think they had uh, um, Department of Agriculture started a, 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 a program where your food came from. And Oklahoma Energy Resources Board, they had a lot of money and they spent it developing the program for, for uh, people. Is that pretty well? I think that does it. Yeah. Um, one of, one of the things that I, I, I talked about earlier uh, in the last interview, but I think it, we reinstated uh, the conservation district directors are volunteers, <clears throat> but you've got to have you've got to have people that are full time uh, that help man those district programs, and. Uh, 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 we had a great group of district secretaries. When I came there, they were half-time state or local, which state money provided that local share, and then federal money. And then the feds had a budget cut, and so they started scaling back uh, their support, and all of our district secretaries went full-time for the uh, with state funds. So we had to come up with those. Uh, extra funds. And then um, uh, I think as I earlier said, uh, uh, Steve Lewis was a state representative from uh, from Shawnee and, and he uh, uh, he became Speaker of the House and uh, he uh, called me over there and said, Mason, uh, our, my district employee tells me they don't have uh, uh, insurance in retirement. And he said, let's put the numbers together and let's get that done this session. And so we had uh, district secretaries and district managers came up and, and testified at, uh, at uh, meetings, appropriations meetings uh, for, but we had, you know, what it was going to cost and, and uh, uh, what the escalating cost could be. Two <clears throat> and by doing that, we were able to get more professional people out there um, uh, uh, in different jobs. People that had uh, college degrees that uh, wanted to be home but knew farming didn't pay all the bills and needed that extra job. Plus, they knew their local district and sometimes had given speeches uh, through the OACD speech contest or, you know, different activities over the years. So we got, we were able to get more professional people. And, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Solomon had resisted doing that because of the amount of money that it would take. But when you have the Speaker of the House that, calls you over and says, put the numbers together, we're going to do it. Well, uh, you put it <clears throat> together and then you, you provide the support and so the district employees came up and supported that. So, uh, and you know, if you don't have retirement health benefits, then you don't have the quality of people that, uh, that you should have that, that are full-time. Uh, out there, and we we had some great district secretaries uh, across the state. Sue Harper from out at uh, Deer Creek Conservation District. I mean, she was thinking all the time. Uh, when you saw her coming at a meeting, you know that she had something on her mind. Uh, one of the things that she was instrumental in doing uh, is. As we had turnover of district secretaries, they had to know a whole lot of information because they had to do budgets, they had to do agendas, minutes, uh, plus all the NRCS or SES business too that had to be supported of that effort. We didn't give up anything except money to fund those people. They still worked on federal issues at the local level because they're officed right together. NRCS uh, couldn't have an office if it 
didn't have a conservation district there. But uh, one of the things that Sue saw was uh, the need for education of new employees, new district secretaries that came out. And so we initiated a, uh, a program that uh, when a, a new district secretary would, uh, would be employed, then we would send out a district secretary, um, uh, usually for a day and then wait several months and then, you know, another day or so to help them as they got familiar with their job and, and stuff. So those, those kind of things uh, uh, really helped, um, uh, you know, achieve a, a more professional uh, level of, uh, of when you walk in. People walk in the office and they don't, they just know they need uh, a conservation plan or they came in to get cost share on something. They don't care whether you're state or federal, that's all they want is a plan. And so uh, how do you deal with those people as they come in, the, the farmers and ranchers or urban people? This is like yesterday. Doing this, it just brings me back to yesterday uh, of different things that uh, that we did. The concert leadership program where you were you? Oh, you were? yeah. I, um, we, when I first got there, as a district director myself, I saw that that I really didn't know what my responsibilities are as a district director. You know, I had the older district directors that would tell me, well, Mason here, you know, here's what you need to do at that local level. But there was a bigger picture out there, like inspections of upstream flood controls, <clears throat> uh, like uh, local education. Uh, things like coordinating uh, different e efforts with the extension director for that county. All those kind of things, working with Farm Service uh, FSA, uh, all of those things uh, you, you don't know uh, uh, about. And so I, uh, early on I wanted to uh, have an education program and uh, kind of hold over from uh, Leonard Solomon that uh, uh, you, you told them what they want and needed to know mm -hmm. uh, instead of them asking what they needed to know or teach them this bigger picture of what their responsibilities are. And finally, uh, uh, I, th I think we had some type of leadership. Of, uh, I think we did it on a, a, a kind of a regional mm -hmm. area first. Uh, I remember one we held up at, uh, at Dewey in Washington County, and we had a whole bunch of district directors in there, and I was trying to explain to them and I love to use a uh, uh, flip chart and, and different color pencils. And for some reason, I'd, and being up there in the Osage country in, in Washington County, I, I, I thought about a wheel and I drew a wheel up there and then we started doing these spokes of this wheel with the conservation district as the hub. And uh, I would let them join in. So who else do y'all coordinate with? Who the other people? The Cattlemen's Association, um, you know. All and, and so we drew this colorful wheel that had ended up like I don't have many spokes. We finally wound it down with, but uh, and, uh, we had a lot of spokes going out of that hub uh, that we that a conservation district. Uh, uh, touched, and I, I think that was, you know, just kind of part of being innovative or thinking out of the box. I think Hal Clark said the group came out to his. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Just after I left, uh, I think uh, the person that took my place, Mike Thralls. Uh, uh, that was one of the things we were working on and 
uh, he had come over to us from the Department of Agriculture, and so that was what we kind of assigned him doing is think about uh, how we did director education, and uh, and and. And so they were able to do that for several mm -hmm. years yeah. uh, there. And not a big group. I think this year they got some outside money to help uh, uh, ha help start it up again. And they have 15 mm -hmm. directors, I believe. Well, that's a good sign. But if you Disney. pick them from different parts of the state, and they can go back and uh, to their area meetings and, and talk about it to their local districts. Well, do you get very many phone calls from people saying, you know, help asking you questions since you've retired? Uh, Not too many? No, I, I, my policy has been, um, and, I, and you know, sometimes it, it's n nothing that just happens, but Mike Thralls that took my place, I have to say this, uh, even though Ben sitting here, when <clears throat> when I uh, found that I was going to leave and go to a different job, Ben and I were uh, traveling to a conservation district meeting uh, out uh, western Oklahoma and, and I got him in the car and just he and I and I said, Ben, I'm going to retire uh, this fall and and I want to ask you if you wanted to be the director, uh, uh, executive director. And I said, you don't have to tell me now, but I need to know pretty soon. And I said, you're the only one that knows that I'm going to leave. And uh, he said no. He had young, two young children and wanted to make sure he could spend as much time because I, I went and did a lot of things. You know, I got involved in some federal programs and was on some national committees and, and going a whole lot. But uh, this uh, Mike Thralls had been over at the Department of Agriculture and still wanted to be part of state government and uh, he was no dairy farmer like me and we connected real quick and and I asked him and and uh, told the commissioners that you know you could interview a lot of people but I think he would do a good job and he did for how mm -hmm. many years uh, almost I, 20 but, 15 yeah at least 15, 15 yeah. years yeah one of the longer serving yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he did uh, uh, did a real good job uh, there, and uh, uh, of course he had a good assistant director in Ben Pollard to sure. kind of guide him. But all of the and 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 I told him when I walked out, I said, "You can call me, but uh, this is your business now. Mm -hmm. It's not mine. I'm not going to be there." And uh, and I. I went to Oklahoma Farmers Union and was their government relations person or lobbyist uh, for them and they always knew that I was over there at the Capitol watching bills and, uh, and it was all they had to do is just pick up the phone or sometimes I would see something that they needed to know about and, and I would tell Mike or Ben. Uh, one time I did get into uh, into uh, a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of discussion with the administration over there. I, I had told uh, 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 Clay Pope, that was the executive for the uh, OACD. Uh, he asked me a question. I don't remember what the question was, but I could remember, you know, how it happened and why and you know how it was put together whatever that was well clay would take something and he would move with it and got ahead of ben and uh, and ben called and said mace uh before you give some of that history to clay well be sure and talk to me and i said well I, I, you know, he asked a question, and I tried to respond to it. And, 
what was that issue? Do you remember what it was? I, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, Ben called me, uh, called me on that and said, just give us a heads up so we're not caught. Oh, it was probably a hard phone call to make. Yeah. Well, it took it all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we did. You know, the corrective discipline is really important. Yeah. That's another thing that we did. Uh, Governor Bellman, uh, when he came in, he expected his uh, his agency head to be supervisors, and he wanted them to be trained, and he provided a a, a two day training session with. Uh, you know, I was in the. I sat right by the head of corrections, and then I sat right by the head of of the the human resources for the state. And um, going through that, I understood how important it was to under what your job was, not only your job but your supervisors, mm -hmm. like the AML program, water quality, conservation district. Uh, uh, all of those kind of things, and we had a couple of employees that we were having trouble with, and and I found out through that program that uh, that you could uh, you could uh, hire human resources to put on these for just your agency, put on these uh, training programs of how you deal with supervision, and the first one. That we had was corrective discipline, and and uh, it, it was I've, I've used it uh, uh, many times over the years mm. to do corrective discipline on on employees. But that just that was the first one. And then we had uh, the first ones, the first two years. Well, I picked them because I knew what we were lacking, or I was lacking. And then after that, then we let the supervisors pick from us, like time management, well, things like that. Good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you have your your plate was pretty full most of the time. Well, I don't, I don't know. We had we we oh, had, to, had time to have fun and, and what enjoy. What would that be? What would you consider? What what would you do for fun? I'd. I'd I, I, it was fun to go out and meet with the conservation districts no, to no, go. No, not work related. What would you do for fun? Go fishing or hunting or? Oh yeah, hunting and fishing and and go to the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I step out of that office and put on my overalls down at the farm, and I'd get corrective discipline from Dad down there. <laughs> yeah. I, t I told him one time, I said, Dad, I don't know that I, this is that first six months when I was under a lot of stress from the legislature by those fire trucks. <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I can do that job. And Dad said, uh, well, you asked for it, didn't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I did. He said, well, then go get it, do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it, you know, it was just, uh, a lot of, a lot of, you know, when you're with friends and with family, and uh, that was part of what conservation was about. It was, uh, was, uh, it was multi generational, mm. and um, uh, you know, it was a big family around the state because when. I went to Buffalo one time to a district board meeting and, and they served us beer ox. Never had a beer ox because that was an old German settlement up there. And uh, uh, I, I thought, you know, what a, what a neat deal. And they had lunch. They'd have their meeting during lunch, and, uh, over lunch, and have something brought in. Somebody made beer ox and brought it in. But just, you know, those kind of things. Late nights on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, driving in snowstorms and ice and rain. And, uh, Flat tires? Uh, I, that first, uh, let's see, that first year I was up in the, uh, going up northwest and driving across 
someplace and the wind was up and the tumbleweeds were coming across and the tumbleweed got underneath my car and <laughs> <coughs> I didn't have any gloves and uh, if you've ever tried to pull a tumbleweed that, that's hung up next to your muffler, you know, uh, that you could catch the car on fire, well, uh, the tumbleweeds, the, the uh, thistle, uh, German thistle, I think is mm -hmm. what they are. They're pretty hard, yes. Pretty hard, hard and hard, got uh, spines on them, mm -hmm. uh, too. But I got it out and I watched, uh, went a little slower and watched the tumbleweeds because there's just certain areas that they they were coming across there. You've got lots of memories. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, for later jobs, it gave me the understanding of the state of Oklahoma because mm -hmm. I've been in ever county seat in the state mm -hmm. and because uh, that's where usually the office, the local district office is. Um, gave me an understanding with the commissioners uh, more in depth about that area and then of course working with the Soil Conservation Service we we had some great relationships on with soil scientists. Uh, the wetlands program came in in the uh, next farm bill, the 90 farm bill or sometime mm -hmm. right in there and uh, uh, Jim Henley was soil scientist and uh, I said Jim are you, when are you going to be testing down in Natoka County? I said I want to meet you down there and go out with you when you do your testing. I want to understand what you mean about hydric soils. And so he took me out and went to Boulder Seat, and, and which is a uh, nature conservancy site now. It wasn't at the time, but uh, it was a wetlands that was natural wetlands that had been there for uh, hundreds of years, probably because of the way the land sloped into it. You just don't think of Oklahoma having wetlands. I don't. Oh, yeah. We've got lots of wetlands. Or yeah. alligators. Someone said we had mm -hmm. alligators too, mm -hmm. but yeah. you don't think yeah. of that. Yeah. And, and another thing with the commissioners, uh, uh, we would have commission meetings uh, in different parts of the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went down southeast Oklahoma to Ida Bell one time. and. They had a great tour for us down there. Went to see the upstream flood controls in Red Slough, uh, that it, uh, south of Idabel, it drops off into the Red River Valley, and they those creeks just don't head right to the Red River. They meander down through there, and it's good farmland because it's real deep topsoil, and. Uh, so they formed a, uh, oh, a conservancy district. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, a past executive director was the head of the uh, Bar Association, Marvin Emerson. Marvin Emerson. And uh, uh, we were trying to figure out how these conservancy districts work. Well, he was part of help craft the bill to set up conservancy and master conservancy districts mm -hmm. and uh, like uh, Thunderbird Lake down at uh, that provides water for Norman Midwest City and Dale City is a master conservancy district uh, McMurtry that provides water supply for uh, uh, for the city of uh, Stillwater I think that's under a master Conservancy dish. So, you know, when you didn't know how things were and you knew the people that may have had a hand in setting up the law, then you went to them. And, and, and he, he couldn't remember at first, and then we started talking to him about it. And, and then it was just like an open book. The, the floodgates opened, and, and he remembered, you know, people that were involved. Yeah. A lot of on the job learning too. Oh yeah. Sounds, sounds yeah. like too. Yeah. Common uh, sense. Common sense, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Conclusion? 
I, I, I just want to uh, thank OSU and the uh, uh, the uh, Oral History Foundation, I guess is what it's called, for being able to do this because, uh, the, you know, I had, I had uh, the good fortune to know some of those original board members mm -hmm. and Lawrence Drake from up in Harper County and went to his place and saw Ditch Valley that was uh, prior to statehood. They have prior statehood water rights that they dam up the Cimarron River in March and run it down this ditch and irrigate land for 12 miles uh, parallel to the to the river, following the contour and and stuff. You know, you I would have never known about it, but they and they irrigate just till June until the salt content, the water flow decreases and salt content increases, and then they break the dam and. If the dam breaks with the flood, then they go back out there with their, probably started with teams of mules and horses. And, uh, but just learning all those parts of the state and how they, uh, how they work is, 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 is hopefully you capture, uh, able to capture that on this whole history. Yeah, it's, it helps with the mental picture too. I mean, uh -huh. what, yeah. what areas look like and things going on in each each part of the state is different, oh, yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one time, the uh, Ward Perryman was considered Mr. Chairman. He was the chairman of the OECD nominating committee, and I wanted to go down and see him. He was getting pretty old and got off the district board but still involved and he had a little old house out north of Duke. He had lost his wife and he said, uh, I was going to take him to lunch and he said, no, we're going to talk here at my house. I'll just cook you something. He brought out an old cast iron skillet and threw a piece of ham on there and a little can of English peas and, and heated them up in a can of, uh, well, uh, cut up fruit and that's what we had for lunch but <laughs> we uh, you know all of those kind of things are vivid memories and this kind of helps renew that mm -hmm. uh, that time but uh, I, I just they'd invite me to go to uh, uh, to speak one of the things <clears throat> that my first understanding of conservation districts was that uh, Bankers Award. Back in the 50s, bankers saw that um, if they had good conservationists out there as the farmers, that they did better than uh, some people that didn't practice good conservation. And so they supported uh, 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 yeah, a Bankers Award in that county or that conservation district. and. And because we were in the milk business, we would carry, sometimes we, I think we did the barbecue a couple of times and and have milk there. And that was part of our, you know, contribution to it. And just when I was little, I would go with my granddad and grandmother and uh, to those and then have a, uh, a district, con uh, you know, conservation award and then uh, district director and, and had those and they continued all through, they started dying out because as banks consolidated, you didn't have that local involvement as much. But uh, giving speeches that to that, not speaking on because people drive in, they drive in for the meal and for the camaraderie and um, you want to give them good information in five to eight minutes and and uh, write it on your hand write it on your <laughs> hand no I, I usually had a card my hand would come in if i didn't have any piece of paper but uh, oh uh, uh, one of the things i didn't mention with the the uh, uh, the education. Uh, 
outdoor classrooms were starting to bloom as we started these uh, 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 wildlife and, and project wed, all of those learning tree. Uh, what best to have a place for young children to go and see hands on about what grasses were, soils, and what made up that soils of earthworms and wetlands. Well, uh, 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 from Chelsea, uh, George, Rogers, Fraley. George Fraley. George Fraley and his district conservation came in there one day and rolled out this map of this uh, area that was behind Rogers State College, now Rogers University or whatever it is, and it was right across the street from Will Rogers Memorial, but this was an unused area that had grown up over the years and it was still part of that and we had gosh we had Philip 66 and a bunch of doctors that contributed to that plus we had the uh, they the uh, president pro tem in the senate was from uh, uh, from Claremore, Claremore. And so uh, I said, this is just what we need. And I said, let's go talk to, uh, uh, I can't remember how to call his name. Is it right? Steve Taylor? Stratton Taylor. Stratton, Stratton Taylor. Taylor, yeah. Stratton Taylor. And so we got state funding to help that. And I guess they have 20, 30,000 children from Tulsa, that whole metro area that come up and go through that and they have a walk and they, it was a, it was an old natural, it was an amphitheater where they, I guess, years ago had had uh, plays and the benches were there and everything. And it was just a beautiful amphitheater. And so they had, uh, they got money to, uh, to asphalt the trails where they were handicapped accessible mm -hmm. and a boardwalk across a they met a wetland and uh, so you had all of the elements of uh, of of uh, uh, project wild and wet and, and you know all of them right there in that what about a 40 acre site or so yeah but they nice. they just came in and you know they had talked to me about it and I said come up with a plan when they did, they came up, I mean, it, it drew out all of, they they thought long term, mm -hmm. here's here's the grand plan, and, uh, and it was like a huge conservation uh, plan that was for children. Is it still there? 30 it's years. Still? It's been there 30, 30 years. 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's still operating now. Huh? Yeah. Cool. Conservation Reserve. Yeah. Your fingers been in a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, but you know they they brought it up, and uh, I found the way uh, way to uh, achieve their uh, their dream and their goals. Yeah. Function as a bridge again. Huh? Function as a, a bridge. Oh yeah. A bridge again. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Getting yeah. Bridge point many point generations eight. there. Yeah. It was. That was a lot of fun. There was a lot of them, you know, smaller uh, sites that were developed. But that one, they they got a lot of money from a, a, a group of doctors, mm -hmm. and, and plus fit, uh, Philip sixty six, and then some state money that put it together. And then, you know, you put something like that together, and then how they're going to operate and maintain it, and. Uh, they look long term to get to that. Okay. Anything else? No, oh, I'm sure we could. Going, going, going once. I feel like she here saying, okay. <laughs> well, well, then we'll say thank you again very much. Well, thank you for, for doing this project because I think your interviews will, uh, will provide the bridge for the future generations. And understanding the past. Yep.